Right. And we should be live now on Facebook. Thank you guys for joining us. Omar, do you want to go through our uh, our top of show since we don't have Chris with us tonight? Of course, of course. So I want to go over the house rules today. Chris had a family emergency to attend to, so everybody please send your blessings towards him for today. It's an important day for him and his family. Uh, a couple of things on the house rules side, right? We go live every Monday at Every Monday. Now we're doing Sundays for now, but this will change back in uh, at the beginning of November. So two more shows and we'll be back to regular scheduling. Uh, sorry, join the... If you want to uh, call us, you can email us or call us at the number provided below. Get you into the Zoom panelist side now. It's a little setup we've done a little bit different to make it more interactive for you guys out there. Going on along here. Uh, due to the nature of streaming, there might be some dropouts. Please refresh your screens on the Facebook side. Uh, please be patient with us. You know, we're doing the best that we can. Uh, be the sharp shirt in the room. Ask your questions. It's a live Q&A session with Josh. He's going to be able to answer all your questions about TriCaster. Don't go too far. Don't go too much into it. Allow him to do some of his presentation as well. But you guys are welcome to ask questions. This is a live open format. We try to uh, make it as communicative as possible. Uh, and we don't know everything. We're not the, the know-all to know all the answers. So don't be too shy to ask a question. Everything's welcome here. We'll address them as quickly and as fast as we can. Uh, on the panelists this year, we're here to help us and to help you guys as well. So to, please don't be afraid to ask your questions. We do not claim to know it all. Final slide up right now. Uh, again, this is a live Q&A session. So thank you for being here. Please come with questions ready for us. And a shameless plug, please follow AV Educates uh, on our social media channels. And I will throw this back to Ed. Great. Thanks, Omar. Uh, and as we as we get started, I just want to thank uh, DVE Store for their continued support of AV Tech Talks. Please check them out at DVEstore.com. Thank you guys very much. They uh, they help get us some uh, some better resolution for the Facebook side, and we greatly appreciate that. So um, tonight we are talking with uh, Josh and Chesarek, right? Is that correct? Do I say it right, Jer Josh? Yeah. Excellent. That's good. I'm, I'm like terrible with names. So, uh, and I, I realized I didn't go over it with you beforehand. <laughs> so, uh, thank you guys for joining us. Thank you. Uh, thanks to our panel. Um, Jeff Keithley joining us again. He led us through a great talk last week on NDI. So we're happy to have him back. Um, I guess, uh, Jeff, you, I know that Josh, obviously you're a TriCaster user. Jeff, you're also using the TriCaster. Is that correct? Ever since TriCaster 100, which was the very, very first little shoebox. That was awesome. Uh, in the SD days, most of you guys probably don't even remember that. Well, Dave does. He's an old guy like me. But, uh, we, yeah, we've, we've got a lot of experience with the TriCaster. And also the newest uh, Vector Plus, which is the on-cloud or, or virtualized version of the TriCaster. Oh, okay. Cool. So, oh, so you... Um are you using that with a, like something like AWS or something? You're using that remote in the cloud? Indeed. Indeed. Completely all in the cloud. Man, it seems like every week there's just more and more hints that we need to have you come in and do that remote production talk. Whenever seems, you're ready. But I'm, just, I'm actually getting to go to back to work, so Mondays are going to be tough. But I, I'll do my best to, to clear some schedule if we can. All right. Well, we'll, we'll we will figure it out. We will figure it out. Uh, Dave, uh, you have some experience on the TriCaster as well? Um, I've used it once or twice, but it was probably a decade ago. So, yeah, it was back in the SD days. Gotcha, gotcha, gotcha. My experience on the TriCaster is, is somewhat limited. Um, I've used a couple with the, the 2ME Surface uh, a couple of years ago, and then I have one client where I'm always the audio guy on the show, uh, and the client owns the TriCaster, and the gentleman we bring in to, to run it, who's kind of the TriCaster guy for this particular uh, company, he always complains that they never update their firmware, so he's always having problems. Uh, he can never get NDI to work because the TriCaster's on really old software. Um, so that's that's always my experience. But uh, I know it does a whole lot. Uh, you know, like I said, I've worked in only on places where I walked in and just pressed buttons. Um, but it's uh, it's a pretty powerful tool. Um, first time I actually used NDI, uh, had an NDI impl implementation. I was a projectionist and i was in a couple days early we had seven projectors in the air and i wired them all with fiber um and there were three tricasters for the show that were going to be taking two different rooms back to a master control and i wired that all with fiber 
And then when the guys with the TriCasters actually showed up on day three of the set, I said, here's your fiber runs. And they said, oh, we're doing it all NDI wireless with Bird Dog. And I was like, really? And they said, yeah, we're just going to do it all wirelessly over like in an expo center over the Wi-Fi. I was like, well, then here's your backup fiber, I guess, because I just ran a thousand feet of fiber between these three spaces and you're going to do wireless. And it worked out great. So I, I, you know, whatever, they had some backup fiber. But uh, that's about all I got about TriCaster. Uh, so I'm going to let Josh take it since he's he's the guy who knows. And uh, Jeff and, and uh, anybody else, feel free to chime in. Where you have it, we'll start taking questions. If you have your questions on Facebook, send them in. If you're on the uh, the Zoom webinar side, please use the Q and A portion for questions. I think the chat is still live, but use the Q and A for just questions, so we can kind of keep it organized. So, uh, with that, Josh, take it away. Hi, how's everybody doing? So, um, I do have some topics kind of set up at the request where we kind of were looking at everything. Uh, to kind of step through the TriCaster, kind of from beginning, get everything configured, start to get going. Um, I have been working with the TriCaster only for a couple of years now. And uh, what I, my normal usage around it is as a one-man operator for the most part in terms of taking care of audio, graphics, replay, switching, all that other fun stuff. So I get really far into utilizing macros and basically all the stuff that Jeff says you should not really be doing. That's usually how I use it. <laughs> just to make sure I push it as far as I possibly can uh, to get the best bang for the buck, as it were. Um, so I want to be able to, uh, I'm going to start out with that. And then depending on where the questions go, uh, maybe we ramp into some of the more advanced stuff uh, and we see where we land. Um, so I'm actually sending all this stuff through my TriCaster. So for, for the very first bit, when we're talking about the session setups, I'm actually going to play back a video I recorded a little bit earlier and just kind of talk over it. So with that, I'm going to transition over. So when you first get into a TriCaster, you're going to be presented with all of the sessions that you already have available to you, uh, which are ones that you've set up. That's the whole idea of being able to open up your session and resume. And this is, you know, you can do whatever you need to in terms of uh, recalling sessions and saving them, exporting them, uh, whatever uh, you need to take care of. But in this case, when we want to talk about a new session, uh, pretty straightforward in terms of just giving it a name. Uh, for what we want to do. And the thing about when we do this initial configuration, the main things we're taking care of are going to be where the heck are we saving this to one of the media drives. I have a couple of them since I installed a few extra. Um, and you can select any of those as your primary. And then templates. Templates are a lot of fun. I utilize those with sports events where I have a base session that has everything I need. So Rollins sports template. And if I use that, then basically this new session will copy in all the active settings, all the active media and bring it into that session as it gets created. And it helps me have that template where I can just really get going really quick um, and then make the changes for that particular new sporting event or whatever it is that I want to do. Uh, but generally speaking, if you're building out a brand new show, you're not going to be utilizing the sessions. Uh, you're going to want to go up and just select uh, empty uh, and you can go from there. But templates are really powerful for that. All right. And then finally, the settings. For the resolution uh, on the TC1 and a lot of the newer ones, you can go up to 4K. Whatever resolution you pick is basically where that session is for life. There are some ways of changing it after the fact, but generally speaking, your session's set in stone in terms of the resolution you're going to be producing at. So in this case, whether I select 1080p 60 um, or any of the others. Now, once I'm in that session, I can definitely step down if I need to give somebody a 720p feed. I can do that on the outputs. Nothing too crazy uh, in terms of that, but I'm not going to be able to say, hey, I want to start doing a 4K session after the fact. So with that selected, I have the name set. I can go ahead and start. Uh, once we're in the session, uh, we have a few options, live being going into the actual production. Uh, there's a couple others, graphics, which if you want to build templates, uh, you're able to go into the graphics system and create a project. You can make templates if you're going to use graphics a lot and want to set up with like Photoshop layers uh, and be able to template that stuff out so it's easy to use once you're in a live session. You can build that with a standalone uh, live text application that they include. And then finally for manage is where you can manage clips if you need to delete stuff. You can also do this inside the TriCaster. But this is a place where if you need to grab a couple of your record ISOs or anything like that, 
you're able to uh, browse around, grab what you need. But for the most part, we're going to be going into the live session. So let's go ahead and do that. All right, so now if we get into the live session, which is what you guys should be seeing here. Um, and let me get this set up. There we go. So when we first come into a TriCaster, um, the way that they try to set these things up is really to be as similar as they can to the standard switchers. Uh, if you look at the hardware panels, uh, Blackmagic, Ross, all the big guys, that's really what they're trying to emulate here. So when we're um, working with the UI uh, on the basic setup uh, for the multi-view, uh, we can customize our panels. We have our main multi-view layout, preview, and program. And then when we come down, uh, we get our switcher row. And again, this is set up to where on a TriCaster, if you don't want to use a surface like I have uh, in my preview, or if I bring that up, uh, this is their main surface. If you don't want to switch from a surface, which I definitely highly recommend, that's I pretty much go nuts if I can't switch from a surface, um, then you can do that entirely from the interface. And the interface is meant to replicate that in terms of program row, preview row, uh, AB switching is pretty common uh, nomenclature for those set up. And then over you go over and you have your transition DSKs and then we start getting into how we break out bins. So um, a lot of people that I know work with like vMix or Wirecast where you kind of build up shots and you can do kind of infinite layers. This is gonna be more similar to a traditional switcher uh, where you have your primary background effectively and then you have what are called DSKs, the downstream keyers that can go over. And then uh, if you get inside the Emmys and the other ones, that's how you do the layering and effects. And then uh, finally at the bottom, uh, we have a couple bins, and this is where uh, some of the where it separates from the the standard switchers, and this is where the all-in-one kind of comes into play in terms of the DDR, the graphics, the sound. Uh, there's the audio mixer, and then you have a couple DDRs. Depending on the model, you may have uh, two. In some cases, you may have four DDRs, but effectively, that's where you have your clip playback, whether that's a individual clip um, or a series of clips. And then similar for graphics, graphics are just limited to graphical files, sound clips if you want to play back sounds. And then on your audio mixer, you come through and have all of that. Uh, and we're gonna dig through some of the configs here. And then finally, uh, it's a repeat on the other side in terms of your extra DDR and then buffers. Buffers being great if you want to do animations, et cetera, you know, live logo bugs, that sort of thing. Uh, we're going to be dropping those into the buffers. All right. So, um, and as you guys pop up, if there's questions, I don't have the chat in front of me, but if you guys want to jump to anything in particular. So uh, from looking at the UI kind of as a whole and how it's laid out, it's um, let's kind of move over to the configuration side uh, for how this all works out on a, on the TriCaster for getting the inputs ready and, some of the differences I kind of picked up on when I was first starting to use uh, the TriCaster. So if uh, over any of the inputs as we come in, I, these are physical inputs on the back of the TriCaster that I have configured right now, but these could also be NDI. Um, but effectively, if I come in to configure an input from the source, uh, this is where the NDI and all the other fun stuff comes up. So right now uh, I have a bird dog camera. That's what's on input two. Uh, I have my laptop feeding uh, one of my inputs, uh, and then also the TriCaster itself. Everything the TriCaster does, uh, it presents out as an NDI feed, which technically you can loop back into the TriCaster, which is what I'm doing on input four, uh, so that I can share the multi-view with you guys. So in this case, I'm going to select local, and on local, you have a couple options for selecting uh, black, which is the default, uh, which is where it's normally at. And then you can come in. So input one through four is going to be the actual SDI inputs. Uh, the TC1 has four uh, physical SDI inputs, four physical SDI outputs. Um, and then you can go nuts with the uh, NDI sources, uh, up to 16 of them technically. On the TC1 that I have, I have the older edition, if you will, the, the original rev. So I have two one gigabit NICs 
and it can balance about eight of those NDI streams over each of the NICs. You're getting a little bit close, and Jeff kind of talked on uh, the fun life of balancing network uh, capacity with uh, NDI and making sure that we don't have anything uh, running afoul there. Uh, but after those, uh, some of the fun stuff when we get to a little bit more advanced stuff is Skype TX, which if you haven't used that, uh, I would say it's different, um, but similar to, say, vMix Caller, if you're familiar with it. Uh, with Skype TX, you can set up a laptop that connects into the TriCaster and basically acts, acts as an operator. And at that point, people can call in, bring in as an input. The TriCaster takes care of mix minus all that other fun stuff. It provides a tally as well. So whenever you bring that person's feed on, they'll get a little red light. You can change what the tally is if you want. Um, and like I said, the biggest part of it is it just, it takes care of mix minus and makes your life a lot easier. That doesn't tie up your audio buses. That's something it's just doing off to the side. Um, and then finally, uh, you can do IP sources. So uh, one, in the more recent updates, uh, which is a great reason to update your TriCaster. Um, I know uh, Ed talked a little bit about a, uh, folks who don't update their TriCaster. Um, I may know a few guys who don't like to update their TriCaster and I'm on the opposite side where um, I do update my TriCaster pretty much religiously on the latest builds. Uh, I do find things that are wrong with them from time to time. Uh, the good part that I definitely will say though is that when I talk to new tech about those particular issues where I can highlight what it's doing if I'm seeing something wrong, uh, they do acknowledge those tickets. They work really good on it. Andrew, Ryan, the guys over at New Tech are great at uh, sorting that sort of stuff out. So on the IP source side, you can bring in RTMP, uh, SRT, and uh, the other fun one I was playing around with the other day is HLS. You can actually pull in HLS feeds, uh, whether that's VOD or live. It'll actually pull in either one. Um, and you can do some fun kind of playback stuff. And then finally, it also does support uh, doing playback off disk outside of the DDR as well. So uh, in this particular case, I'm gonna, I have input one selected and after that uh, we can come down and kind of work through these configurations. Uh, the name in this particular case, input one, uh, button one, if you have one of their more advanced, uh, whatever you put on button, it'll actually show down here. So if you want to call it, you know, main and if we close that out, input one down the interface will change the main. If you have one of their more advanced uh, panels, uh, when you're looking at their main panels, if you have the ones with LED strips, those will actually update to populate whatever name uh, that they have. And this is actually one of the first things uh, that data link will take in, um, or, and that's something we're gonna talk about a little bit later. So uh, when we're doing the names, I definitely recommend giving these logical names. Uh, so if I'm actually doing interviews uh, with folks, I will actually go so far as to put in full names here, which in some cases uh, may be too long to fit into the multi-view that you're using, but I'm not too worried about that, mainly because this uh, title for this video input becomes a variable to the system. So when you're doing, say, titles or anything else, you can reference uh, the video dot name effectively and call that up on the fly. So think about titles for lower thirds where you have a lower third that you're gonna use for your show and you might have five or six panelists on. If you name all their inputs correctly, you can literally use one title and have it set to input dot name uh, for the top part. And then down here under comment, uh, you could give uh, different names, whatever the heck their job description is, et cetera. And that will also pull. So you can literally do a, you know, a standard lower third. And each time you cut the camera, if you have that title up and you cut from input one to input two, it'll actually change it with the cuts uh, so that you can not have to have a dedicated person switching from, okay, bring up graphic one, kill graphic one, bring up graphic two, kill graphic two, et cetera you can actually drive that all off. And this kind of goes back to the whole, make it as simple as possible for one person to operate and go from there. Uh, use external is gonna come into play if we're doing with NDI. If you have a source that already has a name and it has the data available, you can actually click use external and it'll take that information. And then uh, finally under capture, record. Um, the TriCaster will record 
native uh, NDI, they do time sync on the uh, TriCaster. So if you're talking about your uh, primary four inputs, uh, those will all get, so you can do multi-cam editing later if you need to go back and correct something that went wrong or uh, in terms of at post show editing, uh, but you can record, you can set destination. Generally speaking on the TriCaster, uh, by default, you get uh, on the older one, you got two uh, standard drives. Uh, a lot of the new ones have all moved on to SSD, which is fantastic. Um, I've actually upgraded my old TriCaster to have four SSDs inside, uh, so I can do a lot of recording, but with the old uh, 720 RPM spinners, as I like to refer them, they would generally tell you you shouldn't record more than about two streams per drive. So a, a quote-unquote old-school TriCaster would normally be able to record at uh, four of those inputs, and that could also get um, that could also be your outputs as well. Uh, as you get to faster media, and I believe on the new TriCaster, they actually put in a couple SSDs, uh, and they put it in RAID, and now it's, I'm not sure what the limit is, but it's more. Uh, I've personally now done uh, eight recordings, which was the max that I can do without having uh, advanced edition, and uh, I didn't have any hiccups, but I also, the SSDs can write quite a bit. Uh, I know last week Jeff shared... Uh, one of the graphs that kind of outputs, and generally speaking, uh, 1080 or 720p, you're talking about about 115 megabits of video bandwidth, plus a little bit for audio. Uh, so uh, when you have drives that can do about 600 megabytes a second, you can get a lot of content in there uh, before you run out of IOPS. Uh, instant replay. Wait, Josh, Again, sorry. Uh, if, uh... The TriCaster does offer... Sorry, uh, if uh, if you don't mind, if I uh, we have a couple questions, um, and I don't want to get yeah. too far, if that's By all right. All um, actually, I think Disa on the panel had a quick uh, question for you. Well, circling back to the very beginning, you mentioned the uh, the number of inputs being more comparable to a traditional switcher. Can you speak to a little bit more about the outputs as well? Yeah. Um, so on the output side, uh, looking at the traditional, uh, the TC1, for example, uh, it has four SDI outputs. Uh, so during that time, if I come into my output configuration, which is something we'll get to a little bit deeper later, uh, I have mix one through four. And on these, I can either have program, I can choose the audio. There are several buses that I can select and then resolution. I can do session or drop that to other uh, resolutions as needed. And that's on the primary mixes one through four. Uh, there are two special mixes, stream one and two, since the TriCaster can stream uh, from it. And uh, I may be one of the few people that I know of that actually streams from it fairly regularly. I think every time I mention that, Jeff threatens to throw a brick at me. Um, no, 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 no. Tells I, me to I, do something else. Did it all weekend. Did it all weekend. No, I... I... <laughs> I'm 100% use the tool for what it says it's supposed to do. <laughs> yeah. So um, in those particular ones, if we're doing the streaming, I can spe uh, specify for this stream, I want to use Mix 1. In the case, Mix 1 is program and master audio. But I do have the ability to override to say, okay, I want to take Mix 1's output for video, but I want to select aux 1, 2, 3, or master audio. Um, and then if you have a uh, need, it does have some uh, auto gain correction, uh, which I never personally use. And then the last one, which uh, I have used quite a bit, um, is the AV pass-through, which is in the case of a TriCaster crashing, which knock on wood, um, I generally haven't had a complete system type lockups of what you know would be described in that particular case. Uh, but with AV Passer, effectively, inside of the card, it does have a physical capture card. Um, it will pass through whatever you have attached to input for out on the Mix 1. So if you wanted to do a hardware, hardware pass-through, basically, as long as the card has power, it'll go into that mode, which means attach your primary camera with audio to input 1, or I'm sorry, input 4, and it will find its way through. Um, so that's the, the mix uh, side of things. Again, uh, literally anything that's inside of the TriCaster, uh, whether it's program uh, clean, if you want to get rid of the DSK's preview, you can output hard inputs uh, directly out as well. 
and then the media players if you want to just have so like when i do uh replays for basketball tournaments you know back before the days of covid uh that's what i do is i literally make uh mix four just be my ddr2 which is where i put all my replays and i sent that down to the floor for the referees and that's all they would see it didn't matter what the heck i was doing on broadcast they would only see the output of whatever was coming out of ddr2 and if i wasn't playing anything it would just show a freeze frame of whatever the heck was last uh, mix effects for the Emmys, uh, and this is again more the traditional mixers that have Emmys versus just unlimited uh, scenes, sessions, etc. And then buffer and then follow. Uh, follow is a lot of fun. Um, with if we get a chance to talk about, it, it's just the ability to color code uh, program row, preview row, DSKs, uh, so that whatever the heck happens on green when you change it, everyone else who's set to green will follow it. And then black, of course. Um, does that touch on what you're looking for? Is, and again, you can play with the resolutions on the output. But does that kind of cover the the output stuff of what you're looking for, Disa? Or yeah, for sure. Thanks so much. Um, I think uh, yeah. I think Dave had and, a question um, from uh, a little bit earlier. If he doesn't mind asking. Sure. Um, how many Skype TX calls can you do at once? So on the TriCaster TC1, two are built in. And then if you want to do additional ones, uh, you can bring in, they have the talk show 4000. And uh, one of the things that I really like about the, again, the Skype and the talk show is when you're doing this. Uh, so if I come over to my audio mixer and make this a little bit bigger, uh, so it's easier to see, there we go. Um, you have the talk back channel. So when I'm doing uh, talkback, if I have, uh, let's say I take input seven and uh, make this. So in other words, you can go up to, I think I calculated out with uh, Jeff once that the maximum with the 4,000s on a VMC or the TC2, I think was 32 uh, with actual proper mix minusing. Uh, so you could get quite a few people dedicated in there through the Skype TXs. Uh, so if I come down and select one of those and select caller one, uh, let's see, it goes to Skype. And then you saw on my input for caller one, it gave a little Skype logo. So if I need to, um, right here, I have a talk back section and I can set this to be any of the audio inputs I want. Um, I can do line and basically what I can do is I can have an audio input that's meant for my producer. And when that's selected, if I go to their channel, I can solo them to hear specifically them only, so standard solo, and then select talk. And when I do that, I will only send audio back to that specific Skype caller. So only they'll hear. So you can specifically cue saying, you know, hey, Ed, you're going to be coming up next. And Ed's the only person who's going to hear that conversation. And because unless you've intentionally made Ed's audio go into the mix, then no one else is going to hear him either. Obviously, if you mute them and then solo them, nobody can hear him at all. Uh, so it makes it really nice to be able to have that individual conversation. Um, if you want to go to more, uh, one of the things that I really have been enjoying is uh, Skype for Creators has NDI output, and it will do individual feeds of all the people talking, which is much uh, a lot better than Zoom. We'll see if uh, Zoom's next update, so maybe they finally get the hint and put in NDI natively into there. Uh, but with Skype for creators, each person will have an NDI feed. Uh, the, the audio at that point is mixed down, uh, very similar to how like the TC2 uh, does some really cool stuff with uh, multiple people. And at that point, uh, you do lose the ability to have individual conversations with specific guests. But uh, it's a really quick way to have a conversation, you know, with nine, ten panelists and be able to bring in individual inputs that are highlighted appropriately and aren't moving around on you. Um, and the same thing for uh, uh, Microsoft Teams. I've been using theirs. And one of the things that was really nice, uh, I didn't get a chance to play with it too much, was if somebody presents, that presentation is its own NDI source. So you can still build a nice PIP in an ME the way you want it versus all right, screw it. I just lost all my people who are the panelists. It's now just a full screen uh, presentation of somebody's PowerPoint. So uh, yeah, on the TC1 and on uh, on uh, the, I know the mini also got two, but generally speaking, it's either two. There's a few that are one that are built in. Uh, and then if you get the uh, 
the talk show 1000 that's one input or the 4000 it's uh, four inputs of Skype TX. Actually, and those the, are different hardware models, or is that yeah, a software the, upgrade? The Talk Show 100 is actually discontinued. Uh, they EOL'd it uh, in the last couple of months. It, it was more demand of having four or more than one, so uh, yeah. it's just the 4,000 now. And it's so it's one unit, and it'll do Skype uh, TX specifically. But then in the Live Call Connect that's in the TC2 Elite, the Live Call Connect does have two channels, just like the TC1, two channels of Skype TX, and then has the additional Live Call Connect that does another nine channels or more, depending on how you have it set up. Yeah, and the, the Live Call Connect is very cool, but you do lose the ability. I, I can't express how much I love uh, having the ability to talk to a specific panelist and let them know if they're having issues. I can say, hey, we can't hear you, whatever's going on, and I'm just talking to them so the other people can still carry on and they don't hear me trying to coach that person through whatever's going wrong. Um, so that is one thing that I really like about uh, the Skype TX, uh, which again, to me, this would be more akin uh, to the broadcast methodology of bringing someone in on a dedicated feed to you, and then you control it, you decide when they go live, uh, versus uh, what the, and again, the, what the TC2 does with Live Connect, and it also supports Discord, uh, Zoom, Teams, uh, there's a whole slew of it. It is very slick and very cool, and it's very obviously pertinent to, you know, how, how many, how much <laughs> special panelists we're producing, similar to this one, uh, and it does a lot of cool stuff. Um, if you don't mind, we got... Uh... All right few more questions if that's all right um and it looks sure. like it looks like yeah, tonight absolutely. zoom is uh is winning for the questions so we got more zoom questions tonight than we have facebook questions so if you're watching on facebook get those questions into the comment section um from randy he asks uh does tricaster have uh similar features like creating poll questions such as wirecast or other viewer interactions so do they do, no, does TriCaster um, do any of the polls or any of that stuff? No. Um, yeah. It, so you can definitely stream to Facebook, et cetera, and we can look at uh, the streaming abilities that it has. But the uh, primary setup uh, that you have when you're doing that is just to stream out. However, I use Tidler Live 4 um, from New Blue, and that has fantastic NDI integration. And that software does support doing polls uh, through Facebook. It has a few little bugs and uh, interesting gotchas, but you can do it. And when you do that, um, that setup will allow you to do those polls. And then you bring in over NDI and transparency and all that fun stuff. It works right over the network. And it's basically all the benefits of what we've been talking about with using NDI over SDI. So one, one source. And then the part that I really like about it is because it's an NDI feed. NDI is uh, bi-directional communication. So I use macros on the TriCaster extensively. And the macros, I can call for titles from the TriCaster to the so to New Blue software. So I can say, hey, play title one, play title two. I can say, play it on, play it off. I can do an auto transition, et cetera. And that's just from the macro commands. Uh, so I don't necessarily have to have someone sitting there. So if I have a title in that's queued up or a poll that's ready to go, I can queue it from the TriCaster side and the software on a laptop, PC, or Mac uh, just keeps running along. But that is a third-party solution uh, to bring in polls. And I've also seen people, I believe, uh, a while back, Casper CG, which is a really popular one, obviously. They support uh, NDI from what I saw, and I see a lot of people using Casper CG. And then um, CharacterWorks, uh, which I think is the one Jeff's uh, preference is on uh, that I played with quite a bit too, is another great solution to doing those complicated third-party title solutions. Great. Um, so if you don't mind, we'll take one or two more and then I'll let you move on. Um, and people are upvoting questions uh, on the Zoom webinar side. So if you guys keep upvoting them, then we'll know which questions you guys really want answered. So I'll start with, uh, is uh, is cloud video recording available with TriCaster or can it be integrated if needed? 
So I'm going to give my answer and then I want Jeff to kick in too. But um, as I said, when you're doing um, on the input side, you can set up SRTs and I have recorded an RTMP feed. So in theory, I would kind of call that similar, but it's not recorded in the cloud. It's recorded on the TriCaster. Uh, so as I set that up uh, to come to me, um, I can record those. And that's again, as many inputs as you have hard drives to basically record up to eight on the standard edition. And then they go up to 16 on the, uh, if you have premium access. Yeah, and it comes Jeff, to the cloud. If you talk about like your cloud. <laughs> Yeah, and when it comes to cloud, I mean, if you're in the cloud and operating in the cloud, that's one thing. Uh, so say, for instance, if you were in uh, using the, the bigger version of this, which is the Viz Vector Plus, then you're in the cloud already. So yes, you could record in the cloud, but it doesn't automatically go out to the cloud. So it's not like the cloud is a destination other than SRT, where it's sending a stream at that point to the cloud that you could record with another device in the cloud. Got it. That makes sense. Thank you. Uh, and then we'll take just one more for now. Um, how much can you customize the TriCaster user interface? Is there any customization? Yeah, so um, I don't have a great way of showing this tonight, but uh, I actually do have two systems hooked up to my TriCaster, and I am using uh, one of them as a full screen so that I can kind of look at you guys and the camera. Uh, but when you come down here, this is the multi-view. You can set this up to where if you only want four. So this type of customization on the primary workspace. Go and then and on UI. the secondary one. Yeah. There we go. Sorry. Um, there we go. Uh, so, yeah, this is the view for the multi-view. Uh, if I want to punch these in, uh, there are quite a few of these. And this is mainly the layout. And then... Once you get a layout, to, I would say think of the layout as being how many boxes you want on screen. Um, and this portion, the bottom half of the screen, this is the main TriCaster UI, which you have to have. You can collapse it. So if I don't need this stuff, I can drop it down like that and get it out of the way. Uh, if I am feeling really special, I can use their express mode, uh, which gets it even more minimal, which kind of is uh, auto takes whatever the heck you click to. Um, but this this is the customization you can have here, and then on the main stuff, you know, you can scale and drag this stuff around to change uh, the views if you want. Um, and again, I'm doing this through a little bit of a uh, odd setup. Um, but when you're on the second uh, system, uh, you can go in and change out. Uh, on the multi-view and you can come in and customize uh, these views to be specifically what you want. So if you don't want, if you want to move inputs around, you can select various inputs and kind of dial this stuff in. Uh, there's some other fun stuff, clocks, which will utilize the system clock, but also if you set a start and end time for an event, you'll get the more traditional clock type countdown type stuff. So that type of customization is there and you really get more into, when you get into the workspaces, uh, you can do full screen and then you have a bunch of these type of layouts, which that's what uh, they consider their multi-views. So not your primary interface, but the multi-views, which on the TC1, uh, there are three primary um, X, uh, outputs from the graphics card uh, that they run on it. And you make one of those your primary and then you can have two additional on the uh, TC1. I know on the TC2, I think it's up to four yeah, uh, it's running on a quadro uh, card, which you have this similar so it kind has of more inputs. One other thing, too, uh, is NDI out of that on certain versions of the software. That is huge. Just to be able to take your multi-viewer, and then it's just an NDI output on your network. So anybody with the studio monitor at that point, the NDI Tools studio monitor we talked about last week, anybody with that can see the multi-view just the same, and nearly, I mean, with a split millisecond of what, the TDC in it, all on the same network. Very, very powerful thing. Yeah, Great. I'm actually using that multi-viewer system that he's talking about to loop back into the TriCaster. Um, and that also goes on to, uh, when you're doing that uh, studio, if you're on one of the TriCasters, that, that's Windows 10 or higher, which is all the recent ones. Uh, when you're doing that control that Jeff was talking about, you can KVM 
Um, and at that point, your mouse will be sent through to the TriCaster and you can completely control at that point. Uh, so yeah, whenever people are asking like, how do I install TeamViewer on my TriCaster? It's like, no, just, in, just use Studio Monitor on a laptop that's in the network with the TriCaster and TeamView to that. <laughs> and then use the KVM monitor to control your TriCaster and you don't have to install any special software on it or do anything that you're not supposed to be doing. Great. So um, right. we do have more questions, uh, but if you want to, if you want to keep going, uh, if you have more stuff to show us, then we'll do that, and we'll take some more questions in a few minutes. Is that good? Cool. Or uh, all right, let me. Uh, yeah, that works for me. Cool. Uh, we can hop through a couple more things. Uh, so uh, we're kind of going through the configuration. Uh, like I said, instant replay is a fun thing. Um, and again, the comment field, uh, to kind of give you an idea of this, uh, the data link. So I talked about the fact that we could name an input um, and those become data link fields. And if you hit percent, that's their trigger for doing uh, variables. You can see all the variables that are built into the system, session title name, all of these fun things, web keys, if you're doing uh, program source. So in other words, if we came through and said, program source name, that name of whatever the Hexon program, that's the name that's gonna go into the system. So uh, in terms of getting to some really creative stuff, um, again, I do a lot of sports and in doing sports, I use uh, sport uh, Zcasts, uh, Scorebot. Those are pretty popular for anyone who does sporting events. And one of the pieces of software they have is uh, their Scorebot XML. And that XML file, the TriCaster can read. And when you use it, you can basically pull in score, time, any of the data that's available from Scorebot. So when I do my replays, for example, I'll actually put a comment automatically by saying, uh, I don't think I've run one on this, so they won't be in there. They always start with info on the Scorebot, but I can say info, uh, time, period, score for home, score for away. And then my replays as I create them, at the time I ask for a replay to be created, this comment will get translated into the actual values. So when I go back and look at my replays after the game has ended, each clip hat tells me exactly on the clock, there is this much time left, this was the score, and it's all automatic versus having a guy that's sitting there tagging. And again, if I could afford to have a guy sitting there tagging replays as I was doing them and the extra stuff, that'd be fantastic. But again, we're talking about D2 is where I do a lot of my productions. Uh, so they don't have the budget for going all the way out, uh, but it's really cool what you can get away with doing. And again, that's the, the data link stuff. Uh, on uh, the last thing, kind of just going through them real quick, the auto colors, uh, if you want, uh, I don't use auto color, but you can have the TriCaster do its best to match multiple cameras and get them to look as close as they can. Uh, Proc amp, again, this would be like your color shading. Uh, and you can dial in and you can do vector scopes uh, on your multi-view so you can help dial in the colors as uh, best you want and you can control uh, what those all look like. King, uh, which I'm using actually on one of my other inputs, it has a pretty good key here built into it. And then you can do cropping, uh, which is fun where, you know, I have seen some folks where they'll do, they'll bring in Skype that way and some other stuff if it doesn't have NDI where they'll bring up a multi-view and then literally crop down people into singular inputs and uh, crop is a way to do that at the input level uh, so that you're not having to do it later inside of a DSK or something else. And then the last one, uh, just as a quick, which this could literally be its own session all on its own is the automation. This is where I just love this stuff, uh, which is basically to say, hey, um, I want to trigger based on the state. Um, so for this input, for example, I could say program row. If I turn this on and go through, I can say when it becomes active, these are all the macros that I build over time. Uh, there's system ones that come in and then all the STP ones are the ones I use for my show. I can say whenever that one goes on to program, I want to execute this macro. And when it leaves program, I can either do none or I could run a different one. So for example, one of the things that I have is I have a macro that takes away all my graphics during a replay. So it, when I call for a replay and my replay DDR goes online, it slides off all the graphics all nicely. 
And then when the replay DDR2 goes off a program, it puts all the graphics back. So I don't even have to think about it where most people would be like, all right, wipe to replay, take off all the graphics. I just replay and the macros take care of it. And it's not me saying run this extra macro. It's me saying whenever this thing goes on to program, I want to do it. And it's not just program. Uh, I can set it for the ME rows. I can set it as a DSK, uh, Kier, literally all these fun things. The other one is program tally. So literally if somehow this input gets program tally, meaning it's some active live output of the TriCaster, uh, whether it's through the mixes, the Emmys, et cetera, that will trigger tally. And again, I can execute on it. Um, and I absolutely love and use this extensively. And this is where you get to some really, really cool automation type stuff is based off of their automation abilities. And then hotspots, uh, if you turn this stuff on, uh, this, uh, I would tell you if you go search YouTube uh, for a great little example, of this is like Weatherman, uh, where if you're on a green screen like I am, you can literally set hotspots so that if I touch into this hotspot up here, that will cause it to execute a macro and you can write macros to do different things. So in other words, whenever I reach to the bottom left of the screen, advance to the next slide that's inside of my DDR or my DSK, et cetera. Um, and you can have up to eight of those so that you can literally control your presentation if you're doing you know, a talking head type interview or whatever, uh, just by certain matches. And again, you know, a, a weather person is a great example of it, but I've also seen people use it in corporate type presentations really, really well. Very cool stuff. And then tracker is the last one on there, which is the idea of replacing. So think uh, MLB, have a green strip that you want to replace with an advertisement, that type of stuff. And the TriCaster will insert and follow that green. So as you pan your camera around, it'll do its best to assign it into there, which is a lot of fun to play with, but it's tricky to get that set up, right? Uh, so that's the inputs. And again, this is repeat for every single input that are, is on the TriCaster. All right. Thanks. Um, um, last thing I kind of want to... Oh, yeah. yeah, go ahead. Sorry. Go ahead. I'll let you finish up. Uh... Uh, yeah, so um, I'm not going to unmute mine, uh, but it's really just the audio side of it. Um, by default, it's going to follow the video. Uh, source for the audio and auto detect. So if it's an NDI, any of those other fun ones, uh, it will follow through. Uh, you can select local if you have SDI inputs. Uh, there's also on the back of the TriCat on the TC1, TC2, the older ones, uh, the mini 4K is all NDI. Uh, but on the systems like the TC1 where you actually have XLR quarter inch inputs, uh, you can select those uh, to say, hey, I want to follow uh, I don't want to bring in extra audio. So I think three is empty and safe. So if I select input three, um, line would be what's in the TriCaster and embedded would be whatever's coming in on the SDI of input three, if that's what I'm using, or if I was doing an NDI feed, embedded would be the audio that's coming with it. Um, and once again, uh, you can, you get the four channels on the embedded SDI. You can adjust those as needed. Uh, you can make a mono into stereo, et cetera, by panning those up. And then the processing, again, uh, it does. I personally do all my audio mixing on an external board uh, because of uh, some of the stuff I need to do with lots of mixes and then also uh, the latency uh, for audio when you're, uh, to give someone a uh, side tone so they hear it without it being off, off half a step. Um, I'll do it through an external mixer, but if you bring it in, you have full control, you can do equalization, uh, noise gates, compression, all that fun stuff. And then of course, the follow program where you can say, hey, I want this audio to be active anytime I'm using any of these inputs, but not when I'm using the other ones. So common show setups would be, I want all these inputs active, except for when I go to a DDR, because when I play a DDR, uh, the DDR, if we're doing an audio playback, I don't want to hear people talking in the background over the video. So that's the follow program. And then once again, they have macros. Um, so you can do macros. This is a fun one specific to the audio, which you can literally say at a certain volume from that input, trigger a macro. So I've actually seen someone use this as a means to switch a talk show podcast without anyone on it because whenever whoever's talking in the podcast, 
you just set it to recognize that audio level of roughly someone talking, and it literally just cuts between whoever the heck's talking. So no one's actually running the TriCaster. They kind of just set it up and hit go. And yeah, if two people talk, um, I've seen some creative solutions that'll kick it to the wide. And then when nobody talks, it'll, it'll always kick to wide because you can say, you know, on the execute, when they're done talking, the inactive macro is to kick to wide. So again, uh, fun setups in the automation where you can effectively get it to be as hands off as you can. And this is how my success kind of comes around when I do these one man bands. It is absolutely pre-production that makes this stuff work, getting these things set up, getting them tested, and then learning on the macro side, i.e. states. Um, I have macros that set up my show into a particular known good state so that I know that when I say bring graphics on that I know that the graphics are off. And then from that point forward, I'm good. Uh, but having to work through that stuff is a, it, it takes a little bit of work, but when you do it, uh, you get a lot of uh, control and power. And then finally routing is the last one I'm gonna go over in terms of the config stuff on the inputs where by default, we have a uh, four in, four out um, for the audio channels and you have your master, aux one, aux two and aux three. So you have four uh, sub, you have a total of four mixes on the TC one uh, that you can do with four audio channels and uh, this is where you can create mix minuses. Uh, you can do a whole set of like, uh, if you're doing a uh, talk show old school and not using NDI, which I do not know why you would do, but if you wanted to, inside of one submix, because there are the four channels, you can actually set up each person of the four inside of one strip and the other person the other to create a mix minus so that even though you're doing four people with mix minus, you only burn one aux out. Uh, Kane Peterson has, there's a really great tutorial on YouTube under the new tech, uh, which I think we have some links to send over to the uh, new tip, new tech uh, tutorial uh, tutorials on YouTube. And they kind of walk through how that works. But this is, you know, an old school matrix setup where uh, you can, you know, clear and then set up exactly what you want to come through and go out or vice versa and build those things out. So, uh, as an example, uh, sometimes we do radio broadcasts with uh, a video broadcast for the colleges. Um, and in certain cases where we want, we'll actually stream the audio only out via the TriCaster and we bring that in on one of the cameras and then we put them on aux three and then we stream out aux three as a separate source. And we're literally producing two shows with two different audio tracks. And that's also a similar way when we have to do multi-language broadcasts where someone says, hey, we want to have Spanish commentary. And we'll do similar there where we'll say, okay, aux one's going to be Spanish, master will be English, and we'll line everything up. And then when we come to the output side, we'll say, okay, on mix one, that's going to be master and that's going to be English. But on mix two, we're going to go to aux one and mix two will now have Spanish. And you can do lots of fun stuff. So. I'm gonna pause there, see if there's any other, if there's any new questions, is that's kind of the, the configuration. And at that point, you just repeat up to, in my case, 16 inputs. Uh, if you go get one of the Viz vectors or VMCs that Jeff was talking about, then you're up to 44 or so. Um, pretty crazy. Sorry, there we go. Uh, great, so thank you. Uh, and. Talking about the audio just led into uh, a couple of questions that had gotten upvoted about audio. So I'm going to go there first. Um, Randy had asked, uh, does TriCaster have an audio equalizer feature independently, or do you have to adjust it from the mixing board? So you kind of answered that, but maybe you can show us um, where that is. Yeah, um, I personally do uh, compressors on my external for individuals, uh, depending on how excitable they are. But when you go into processing, you can do that specifically on each input. And the uh, under the compressor limiter section, that's where you can adjust your threshold, the ratio, attack, etc. And I think that's what he's asking about in terms of being able to say, if I bring in uh, somebody on input one, input two, input three, you can then set compression uh, and limiting uh, for each of them. In my case, uh, I'm almost always about the limiting because I have people start screaming into their headset when they get really excited and then blow out the audio for everybody. 
he also can actually control it depending on the version if you have live panel you actually can control a lot of the audio features with live panel which is a it's basically an add-on unless you have the TriCaster 2 Elite which has that built in and with audio panel oh you've already got it there you go so go to the audio mixer and you can show them exactly that what they could see somewhere else on the network so that's a web page that's served by the TriCaster and you can see the sync going in there. Uh, click the gear, Josh, and does that pop up the additional controls there? Yeah, I thought it did. Uh, not at least all that's of the them. It's not the EQ controls, but it is the sub controls for the sub channels within that physical fader. So there are there's some ways to make so some audio. The yeah, and one of the things about that when you're talking about what now that we're kind of into this is the other part where i've kind of gone nuts with the uh tricaster is under resources and then uh it's been a hot minute since i've had to go in here uh fiat lux let there be light their commands uh over all of these commands are available via their in their api which is basically a restful api so audio states pretty much all the controls you could ever possibly want are available to you through here. So if you want to write your own software, or if you're like me, I do. I work with uh, content delivery networks and live in Linux and Bash scripting. Uh, you can make calls with curl uh, and control the TriCaster, which in call, includes calling macros. So even if you find something you can't necessarily directly call, but you can recall it in a macro to control it, you can call the macro. So um, there is a crazy amount of customization that you can do with this. And again, what um, I, again, I don't use this, but under the builder page, you can literally build out uh, pages which are available on the network that I, you can hop on with a iPad, Android, or just another computer. And you can assign buttons to go through and control uh, the TriCaster. So you can give like graphics, et cetera, to somebody else that's not physically on that system. Or if you get towards the stuff like Jeff's doing, you can start calling things from people who are a couple thousand miles away and they don't need to be anywhere near your show to help you switch uh, what they're up to, what they're seeing, which is, you know, it's a lot of fun. I'm, I'm really big into the, like I said, the automation and being able to go through because through the API, you can read states to let you know what is on program, what is in preview and you can then start to actually do logic to say, okay, when the following conditions are met, I want to do this, which is way beyond the macro capability of the TriCaster currently in terms of saying you can do controls, but not like if then wait, pause, you can do pause, but like you can't get to what I would call programming. Uh, but you can do that externally using the API, which is pretty cool. All right, I think we got a couple other questions. Yes. So uh, on the, uh, I'm going to stick with the audio just for a second, so we stay kind of in theme. Um, what? Yep. Uh, can you show us how to do the mix minus if someone was taking a virtual input into Zoom from the TriCaster on their laptop, and the laptop was being used as a source on the TriCaster? So how would we do uh, mix minuses? Yeah. So if, um, let's just say that I have uh, input one is the Zoom, where I have everybody coming in and talking, and the mix minus that I want to give back to it, I'm going to make that uh, inside of aux one. I would basically go to input one first and clear them out. So in other words, I don't want the audio coming in on mix input one to go into the audio of aux one. So I'm going to clear that out. Now, the audio coming in from the Zoom that's on input one will go into master, it will go into aux two, it'll go into aux three. And I mean, I could clear those out too if I wanna do some other fun stuff. So in other words, the show, what I'm gonna be sending out to say YouTube or Facebook like you guys do, that's gonna be on master. So I have everybody sending the master as that master uh, audio that everybody has. And then, uh, so I have them cleared out and then on all the other inputs, so whether that I have more people who are talking via other means on input two, I will make sure that they are checked for aux one. And then when I'm done with this, uh, effectively aux one will have everything that I care about 
except for input one. And then uh, at that point, uh, when I'm inside of here, uh, there's a few extra things I can kind of control, but effectively, if I'm happy, I can do some equalization on the aux as it goes out. But finally, what I would do at that point is I would set one of my, uh, I'm looking at the wrong screen here to be able to see this easier. I would set my mix out to say, okay, um, mix two, for example, that's what I'm feeding back to the zoom. I would select program, or if I want to select a multi view, like I can select any number of things that I want as the video. But on the audio side, I would say, okay, I want to use aux one. That's what I programmed to be my mix minus. And that's what I'm going to hand back to the input to zoom or whatever the heck I'm going would be this output um, from the TriCaster. In this case, I've done it with mix three, but aux one is what I've built up. And if you, have something that allows you to break apart channels, you can get really creative. This is what I was talking about with the um, the uh, the talk show. When you bring in, like if I look at this audio input, it's showing me four uh, channels of audio from my SDI. So if the application you're sending this audio feed into can actually see the individual channels of the uh, SDI output, the routing, you can then get creative where you can say, hey, I'm on this input, I am going to go in on one. And for the out though, like we can, we can bring these in. So in other words, on channel two, input one is missing, or in this case, I'll put it on this guy. And then, so in other words, I've created a mix minus inside of aux one on China, channel one. And then for the person who is on input two, I would do theirs this way. And then for three, I would do it this way. And then finally for this one, I would do it this way. So this is actually how you'd set them up uh, abbreviated uh, for the, like the talk show, because on the talk show side, when you're looking at the inputs, you'd say, okay, this guy only gets channel one and you would mute the other channels. So they won't hear them. So in a way you can actually create a mix minus inside of aux one or any of them by using the individual channels uh, which is kind of cool but again the other side whatever you're feeding to has to be able to see those individual audio embedded channels so you can control them not everybody not everything can zoom no <laughs> not happening uh, so in that case if you want to do a couple of mix minuses you got to use these extra auxes but if you have something that is able to see the individual channels instead of burning three out, you know, I just did technically four mix minuses with one aux. If your other side is able to pay attention to the individual channels. That's uh, that's great. Unfortunately, I guess it throws away because the TriCaster can only do the four channels. It throws away the other channels that an SDI would carry or an embedded HDMI would carry. But, but yeah, um, I do not have the model. <laughs> I don't. Yeah. Yeah. So I don't have advanced edition um, or I, no, what do they call it? Premium access, sorry. Um, they do have an add-on. Uh, it's a little pricey at about $200 a month. Um, or if you get a TC2, it's included out the gate. They, they give you everything on that one. Uh, but that's where you can get into like Dante. And that's where Jeff comes in and goes nuts and all sorts of fun stuff where you can do way, way, way more with the audio control than compared to what I'm doing here and you're seeing in front of you. Copy. Okay, that's. I don't know if you want to talk about some of that stuff. No, <laughs> that's a rabbit hole we don't want to go down. <laughs> it's, it's a very complex rabbit yeah. hole. Uh, it's a beautiful thing when you have yeah. a Dante workflow, and, it, and with the premium access, it does give you every input as a Dante output. Also, it gives you more on the output side too, so your mixes on your outputs. I mean, it's it's a wonderful workflow. It really is. But depending on the model, uh, like for instance, the TC2 Plus or TC2 Elite, it has eight channels of SDI audio, and the same thing as the Viz Vector Plus, it also does. So it just depends on the model of how many SDIs are exposed. I don't, there's not one that does 16 yet. So if you have to go to the full ESPN distribution where you have 16 audio channels in your SDI, for whatever reason they ever use that many, um, that's the only thing you can't do. So you have to do that embedding downstream somewhere. 
copy of that. Great. So that's that's good info to know. Um, so questions wise, um, Del Miller asks if you would show us how to program and trigger a macro on the TC one. He works on the Ross uh, equity and macros are a wonderful way to work, especially in live sports. So Josh, yeah. you think you'd show us something on macros? Uh, we can see. I've been clicking around here a lot, so. Uh, Just do a do simple do record, do. like pop it up and then this is how i'll always start is just pop up the macro uh, manager and then once you have it started you just hit go do all your clicks of what you want to do and then i go in and delete the times and make it tight and and get the timing down from that yeah. point so easy yep so yeah so um what you should see yeah up here is there are a lot of macros that they kind of come with but um, what you can do uh, in terms of recording the macros where, uh, let's just go down to temp and I'll make a new macro, which we're calling testing or test. And when you come in, you have the ability to edit a macro, which to be perfectly honest, um, kind of what Jeff was talking about, uh, you can literally sit here and dial in every single command by hand typing them in. Uh, or what you can do is record them. So when you come into a new uh, macro setup, if you come in and hit record, and then if I come down and say, hey, I want to bring this down, you can see those commands, which it gets a little crazy uh, if you're doing slider type stuff, where literally every frame that I've inputted will go in. And at that point, you can start to adjust. So let me cancel out of that one and just say like, all right, if we want to go into this guy and record, let's say we just want one that uh, unmuted a couple audio channels. So unmute, 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 and stop. At this point, I now have a macro that tells these items uh, to go to false. So if I go back and mute these and I hit play, you'll see one by one they unmute and they follow along with the timings here. This is in frame. Um, there are ways to do this in milliseconds and uh, forgive me, Kane, I always forget, but uh, in this particular case, uh, if you think it's, uh, if you type in a thousand, I think if you put an S at the end, you can type it in in uh, milliseconds versus frames. Uh, and the good news is, is that the system is storing it as milliseconds in the background. So if I'm doing a show that's at 60 frames a second and I do a macro and I nail all the timings the way I want it, uh, and then I go into a show that's at 30 frames a second. The TriCaster knows and goes, oh, okay, we're in a 30 frame per second one. This is the proper timing. And the, and the macros will still work. Um, so this is like a really basic type macro. And again, this is these, these delays are there. You saw that when I uh, go through and run this one, it just like when I did it, the macros plays it back the same way. Now I have the option to say snapshot for speed where in that case, basically the TriCaster is told, hey, go as fast as you possibly can, which in that case, you see they all just snap uh, to unmute. So you can do a lot of stuff in terms of uh, the control. And to give you an idea, um, let's go look at replay. Um, when we're looking at this stuff like Emmy replay, uh, if I go into this one, this is some of my longer macros where I, you know, I toggle the input where for this replay, I will prepare an ME with a pip in the way that I want it. Um, I will set the DDR to play just a single video instead of multiple videos. Uh, I'll set the playback to 75% because we're doing slow motion replay. And then I just literally step through all of these items until, and then like, here's an example of that new blue title that I was talking about. I have new blue title on input five, so net five and the command starts with new blue, and then I actually have this one set to out because no matter what, I want the graphics to come off when I'm playing my replay. So this takes care of it. So again, I just call this one replay, uh, ME macro, all the graphics, all the audio, all the stuff I could ever possibly care about will get taken care of. And 
in terms of the assignment, so uh, to, to what Jeff was talking about, when you hit record, uh, if I come down to like my surface here, I don't think, it, yeah. So if I hold the macro button, all of the buttons that light up, I've assigned the macros. So like on my DSK, I do all my graphics up here. This is my replay macros to say I want to grab an it. I want to grab one of my primary four inputs for replay. If I want to replay it full screen or picture in picture and some other fun stuff. So this is how I call them from this surface. I also use an X keys that I absolutely adore um, because that one I can label directly what I want and I don't press macro. I literally just hit buttons and it makes it so much easier for others. But there's other delegate stuff that I love about the the big surfaces too. So after I get if I recording one and I start punching my buttons here, so I'll literally do like um, a great example of this is my show openings. I would always like to bring up a, a very consistent um, show in terms of how we do it. So this macro is how I do my show openings when we produce a sport for Rollins Sports. Uh, this whole macro will basically set to a particular uh, DDR clips. It'll play back clips. Think about intros. It will. It gets everything the way it needs to be. Uh, I play some background music, and then I also call uh, some macros. So you can actually have macros call macros. Uh, so in this particular case, I have one called uh, play macro by name audio up sound channel. So that fades in my music. So I start playback of my music, then I fade it up. All of this is going through on the macro side without me having to do anything. I kind of, when it's time to do a show open and we're recording it, I hit show open and then I sit there as the TriCaster literally starts going through its cues. I then count down the talent to say, all right, you're coming live in five, four, three, two, one. And then it goes all the way through until I hit a pause and like, um, so again, I bring the sand channel up when we're ready for it. I do audio channel, I bring the console up, meaning the uh, presenters. And I also have the uh, sideline reporters and some other stuff that I take care of. And then the sound channel, I bring down to soft. Um, and the beauty of this is, is that if I ever wanted to change the audio levels for this macro, like let's say, hey, you know what? The last time I did this thing, maybe I made my audio too soft and I don't wanna edit this huge macro. Instead, I would go inside to that sound macro See if I can find those audio. Can you show us that screen? You right now we're looking at your actually uh, move these into your surface. Oh, yep. Sorry. Um, so yeah, uh, so yeah. Holy crap! That was a lot of talking where you weren't looking at what I was showing. I apologize. <laughs> um, all right. So um, on the audio channel. Uh, this is what I have in terms of adjusting. So if I want to do any of the adjustments here, uh, when I go back and I'll go back to the one that you guys actually weren't seeing uh, from my show opening, uh, to do, do show opener, edit. So this is the show open one that I was talking about where we kind of flow through and then I play macro by name. So macros can call upon other macros as we get through it. I do a lot of uh, other macros, but the idea there is that if I ever want to change the volume that I've adjusted, instead of having to adjust this monolithic macro, I go adjust that one macro and then any other macros that call it, get that update. So you could do all the adjustments inside of this one macro, that would totally work. But if you ever were like, hey, I want to edit this, uh, I only want to edit the, you know, audio down soft channel. And let's say we go look at that one. Audio, soft channel, soft, edit. You can see what this one's doing is roughly every two frames, it's slowly bringing the uh, audio level down a couple value points each time. And I could change this these values. And then anywhere else I reference this macro would automatically get that because it's simply calling this macro. Uh, so that's kind of some there. And then finally, to the other part of the question was assigning it and calling them. Once you create a macro and you have it enabled, these, uh, one, you can call them from other macros, but triggers are usually what we want to talk about here. So if I come back and say, okay, um, if I set this, it'll be listening. And then if I press something on like my surface, which you can see in my preview, 
I hold macro and press one that isn't lit, it's now assigned to that particular row. So now whenever I hit macro and hit this one, it will execute that particular macro and you can assign up to four triggers uh, to each of these macros, whether that's on your keyboard, your big TriCaster surface or an X keys, X key support is built in. So you can literally go through. So if you look at uh, like my replays, you'll see it's calling for X keys because I usually have X keys attached. Um, and then obviously your keyboard as well. You can assign macros to the keyboard and go nuts. Uh, so that's the ways in terms of recording them. The best way, like I said, is uh, I'm a huge fan of set up a new macro, hit record, do whatever you need to. If you screw up, you can stop and then uh, keep recording after. And then once you get a macro the way that you want, you can go in, hit edit, and adjust those values to really nail the timing by adjusting it at the frame level. And then uh, you can also slow them down in terms of the playback speed or snapshot, which is the one I like to use the most, which is basically in order, get through this thing as fast as you possibly can. Um, which I use when we're doing like show setups because I don't want that macro to run for 25 seconds. I want it to be done in two seconds. Cool. Well, thank you. I All think right. that, so, that answered, uh, I'm sure that answered the question. Um, that was a great, uh, and thank you for going back to the part that, uh, that we missed. Um, <laughs> <laughs> yeah. Uh, Randy asks us, uh, what features are available for live video editing? Yeah, so that's kind of the next uh, section as we kind of jumped around a little bit is really, again, like a traditional switcher, uh, which I call, you know, AB switching is the ability to say um, when we when we're in this interface, the idea of being able to say, OK, Coming up next for the next shot, I want to have input five. And when I hit fade, that's what's going to come up. Now, again, you guys are looking at uh, my actual mixer. So when I transition, uh, if I put one, which is my unkeyed source, when I hit auto, it transitions away from whatever's on and brings it over to program. So like that's the most basic live editing is that type of cutting. And again, A, B. So whatever the heck you want to come on, you bring over to preview. Uh, over here on the left side and then as you go on to bring that on you can do cuts autos and we kind of get into uh, a lot of uh, power at this point where uh, by default pretty much what most people do take an auto but inside of the TriCaster um, you do have the ability to do different transitions of which uh, there are quite a few um, I've built a number of transitions as well um, you know, and, uh, they have a, a lovely interface. So as you come through this, uh, there we go, uh, or no, oh, I haven't installed them for this particular section. I apologize, but, uh, we can look at some of the other ones in terms of being able to say, okay, uh, Let's look at, you know, the traditional replay one that you'll see. So if we load that up into the system and now if we use auto, it'll use that replay system to bring me up and go through. So as we do that, uh, which this is where I see separation from like uh, vMix and TriCat and uh, like um, Telestream's uh, solution, uh, Wirecast was escaping me there for a moment, is the idea of that you effectively have a background layer. Uh, which is what that is called background here. And that is your base layer of video. And then you have DSKs, uh, which you can add to on top of that. So in this particular case over here on the right, uh, for the DSKs, I have DDR1 configured, uh, which is the video I was playing earlier. But the DSKs you can control. So if I bring up that DSK, when I start editing it, it shows it in the preview to show you as an example, this is what you're going to get. If I took... DSK1 active, because it's a full screen video, it's gonna take over everything. However, because it's a DSK, I can do positioning on it. So I can zoom it, so I don't want it to be there. So now I can put it up here, and now I've moved it off to the side, so now I've effectively created a pip. But DSK isn't on, so we don't see it there, but if I fade it on, there it goes. It'll come up into the video, and if I, because I have autoplay turned on, uh, you can see at the bottom of the interface, that video started playback as soon as I brought it up to program. 
and when I fade it off, it'll go back and stop unless I have extended play on, which I always do. Um, so that's the editing comes from that side of it. And then um, the delegation. So in other words, if uh, let's say I'm going to add in a couple uh, graphics here real quick. So I have something to look at here. Titles. Grab one of those. And then. Can you trim clips in a DDR, sort of like Playback Pro? Yep. Absolutely. So uh, that's what I do uh, with my. Yeah. So I do, I do a full replay, and if uh, I will have um, the, the links. Uh, I think I sent one to Omar, if you can grab the link. I do a, a replay tutorial that's pretty in-depth and really heavy on macros on my YouTube channel. And as I come in, if I want to trim this, I can set in, set out, or in this particular case, uh, if I want to bring it back out. But I'm like, you know what? Um, you know, let's set in here. Maybe for whatever reason I want to do, if I was doing the thing I do multi-angle, I can actually come in here and do split clip at current frame. Now I've got two clips. They still show the full clip, so I can do editing. They're basically duplicates, but now they're appropriately set up how I had them. And I can do things where I can say, you know what? Uh, alt, oop, as I bring that, I'm reaching for the keyboard, which is never a good idea. Um, I can assign transitions to this, uh, alt F, not spacebar. So now if I am inside of that transition, if I bring this one, this one's a fade, but I can change this to say, Hey, let's do the blinds. So if I bring up uh, DDR one on preview and it's going to come over when I bring that up, we do the main transition. It's playing back. I don't really want to wait for all that. As it comes to the end of a clip, it'll give you different colors. Uh, and I need to turn on list. It now transitions over and uses that effect to get over. So you can effectively, the DDR, oddly enough, can almost be its own switcher. You can actually set it up to have multiple clips with the transitions you want. Um, I personally am not, uh, I like the control surface down here. So this is the delegate. So I have a DDR1 and I can say, you know, do I want it to loop? Uh, do I want to do single play or multi? Do I want an auto play or not? And you can see as I adjust those controls down here, this is, for example, the single or auto. And if I control that on the surface, you see it goes blue for active and white for unactive. So I can control the speed of which um, these clips play back. So as a whole group, I can say, hey, I just want everything. If I was doing, you know, replay in slow motion, if I bring this down to 75%, that's what all the clips will play at. And then I can bring it back up to 100. Or if I want, um, and I can right click on the individual clips and say, for this one clip, I want to play it at one of these preset speeds while the rest play at full speed. So the DDRs have quite a bit of power in them to be able to edit. And then one of my favorite things on them is these bins. So I can set up this clip. So like when I do my sports shows, inside of a bin one, that's where I put all of my commercials. And then in bin two, I have my show openings. And these are basically, think of them as playlists. So I can configure different playlists instead of just having like one massive thing with like 90 clips and then I gotta go find the right one and click on it and be like, okay, uh, we're gonna do commercials. So I'll go up to the commercial bin. And now when I call up DDR1, it'll be there, it'll play through, it'll do what I expect. And then when I leave, I can go back to uh, my pre-recorded can clips, like a sideline reporter that we recorded during the break that we want to bring up. We might put that here. And then when I'm doing my replay, same thing. I will use bin one as my scratch pad. And then bin two will be like my highlight reel, my melt reel. And then I can do groups. So, and again, uh, you can drag this stuff to, to the other ones, but uh, I use macros to automate all that stuff. So when I select a clip and I hit a button, it'll move it to the highlight reel or whatever I want. Um, but yeah, the, the DDRs are quite a bit of fun. And that's one of the reasons in terms of being able to trigger them and control them. That was another reason when, you know, when I was looking at other solutions other than the TriCaster, being able to control the clips so easily in the system through macros, whatever I wanted. 
and as I'm recording a live stream, I can bring these in. Uh, so as a uh, one of the town halls that I, uh, I work with the city of Orlando for their council meetings and for a delayed broadcast where they need to be able to censor since they have the public speaking, if somebody starts swearing, we also share that broadcast with live TV. So we need to be able to do censorship in terms of saying, okay, that can't go out to air. I will actually start a recording of our mix, bring it into a DDR, wait a moment. In this case, I usually wait about 10 seconds. And then I actually play the entire show out from the DDR while I switch inside of an ME. And if something goes wrong, I press a macro that says, okay, on that ME, take off the video that's playing, keep it playing, but show a graphic that says, please stand by and I mute the audio. And when that event is over, I tell it to switch back and it keeps going. So from inside the TriCaster is a method to, again, that's not one of their like advertised features, but through macros and everything, you can actually create that entire setup and it works really, really well. Uh, again, something it was never meant to do, but screw it, let's do it and have fun. In case you haven't noticed, Josh all right. is big in the macros. And he is, I of all all my friends that are other TriCaster users and stuff, he is actually one of the strongest at speaking the language of macros and really leveraging them to help make his shows better than what even a, a staff of four or five could do. He's done so. He's he's being very, uh, very modest about his capabilities on some of his macros. There's times that I've looked at him. I'm like, you're doing what? It's like, why are you making coffee with your TriCaster? <laughs> I, I've heard yeah. of uh, um, I've heard of someone using it. their TriCaster to uh, start a coffee, or I've heard of somebody doing something similar to that. Is is that actually something you're doing, Josh? Uh, you starting the uh, the Keurig? Yeah, um, I don't I don't think I have uh, told Jeff about this, but uh, it was not long ago. I think through one of Kane's posts that I realized that the TriCaster can make HTTP calls out. It won't do anything with it, but you can literally make a post. To a server so on my dedicated servers i had some listeners set up um, one of which we were successfully able to have a system on my server order dominoes for delivery so from the tricaster we could literally hit a button that just called out to the server saying please request this endpoint that's a get food and my server then ordered food for delivery because we already had it pre-programmed uh, so that is uh, oddly enough wasn't setting up the coffee maker but i was getting food from the TriCaster. So literally uh, at the end of one of our tournaments, I think it was by day two, it was a four day tournament. We had it so that when I ran show close, it ordered food on the macro, it would call out to my server. So roughly by the time we were done packing up, food was being delivered hot, which was a lot of fun. <laughs> Not what it was meant for, I don't think, but yeah. That would be dangerous for me. Good times. If, I, if I could order food with my gear, um, I'd be doing that multiple times a show, so <laughs> that wouldn't be good. Um, if you're, uh, yeah, if you're um, for, yes, sorry, if you're up for it, we can do a few more questions because a, a handful more have come in. Uh, yeah, if Definitely. there's uh, if we're in a good spot, uh, Dave from the panel had asked, Is uh, is the stream how is the Stream Deck companion integration? So I have, I don't use the stream deck. Um, I believe Jeff does. I've seen a couple people who will use that API I talked about. Yeah. And Love it. call them and go full wild. And then also uh, central control. If you're going to do anything with the TriCaster, I would highly recommend central control to go nuts with. And then Jeff, like you can talk about, I think companion directly. Yeah, I actually, uh, we were using companion and, and doing, uh, it's doing HTTP calls through the, companion into or you can actually just use the stream deck software to do that simple stuff but uh without a doubt fifty dollars best money ever spent give it to joe joe to max he is he's it should be renamed he's joe to man because that software is unbelievable i think he was on a few weeks ago or something like that right and what you could do like right now this is my stream deck we just set this up this week and so this is controlling my vector plus in the cloud and I got to do exactly what I wanted it to do without a whole bunch of extra buttons. But I had that capability of just applying it on there. It's just an amazing, amazing tool. Uh, yes. Yeah, and I think one of the features, 
Sorry, we uh, just saying we we did have Joe DeMax uh, on recently, and he's watching tonight, and said uh, he would have loved to be here because he loves the TriCaster, and uh, I inadvertently didn't send him the email, uh, so we are not getting Joe's uh, wonderful input tonight because of of my failure. So I apologize. He is in the so, chat um, right now. One though. thing that I'll chat. give one more. Sh- <laughs> I will give Joe a shout out for is, um, go ahead. No, no, that was it. Just wanted to let you guys know he's in the chat and he he immediately responded. (laughs) Yeah. So is for the comp side of things, um, the, on the companion where Jeff has got on his stream deck, you can have the status of like the comps and the preview photos go back. So you can literally update your stream deck so you can see the status. So like, as you go through comps, like on my TriCasters, on my Surface, I don't get a visual feedback. Like I can select comp and dial in a comp if I remember, oh, comp seven for the ME is what I wanted with these people. Hey, Josh, like that's it. I just you didn't really give a, a big else. background on the comps, so you really need to go a little deeper into comps because that, that is, it's like macros, but even better. So show them some of the moves and things that you could set up in a like a two box or a three box or something like that because the, the comps are just, Super yeah. powerful. So I am definitely starting to have. Um, so under the comps uh, in the Emmys, which what I'm doing right now is actually inside of an Emmy uh, for my keying for what you see when I go to my input uh, on Emmy one. So when you see me, I'm on a green screen. I have a background behind me. And that is what we're looking at here, where with a comp, I can set up to four sources layered. In this case, uh, I have my input coming in on 16 as well. And then I have uh, graphics too is what's providing my background. But for comps, if I come over to one of the ME's I'm not using, and by default, an ME is just another switcher. It's a switcher inside of the switcher. So with the TriCaster TC1, I have my primary switcher and then I have four sub switchers. I have four ME's. Um, and that's what this is. It looks just the same because it's an AB type thing. But if I come over, I can select four or two, I can do other ones, but effectively this now is a layering system. And if I come in here and build out, uh, if I put ME2 is what I'm working on in preview. If I go to uh, 16's me, 15's. So I'm gonna put it all to black. Um, if I bring up my video now as one of the uh, bottom layers. I can now scale it just like we were talking about. So I can say position, zoom. So now this is where we start getting to like building picture and pictures. And then over on the second one, we're gonna use the DDR that I had. So we have a clip and we don't want that to be over the full screen. So I'm gonna position that. And we're gonna zoom that out and we'll say, that's my real basic ME. And with comps, I can come up here and take a snapshot. And now that's position one. Now position two, let's say, you know what? I am going to go ahead and make this guy show up and be available for me. Um, We'll go ahead and reset him, close, comp, and now we say input two. So now I have these two inputs and you can see it up on uh, preview here is where it's gonna act upon it. But when I click back to the other one, it does transitions. So with the comps, I can now control inside of an ME. So think about if I have four people speaking type thing, this is where I'd set it up and I'd say, okay, uh, when I click this one, I want them to go full screen and it transitions you know, gracefully over to it. And that's a real quick intro. And what I was getting at is these images, uh, again, with the normal Stream Deck companion, you're not gonna see that stuff but with Joe's software, he will grab the images so that you get a visual representation on your screen stream deck to let you know which mode you're in. So as you punch through, like that to me was like a, I, that almost got me to buy the stream deck uh, right there. Like I said, I'm an X keys fan and Joe supports X keys and I really love them. But I like, as soon as he, I started seeing that, I was like, okay, gotta save my pennies up and buy a stream deck now. Um, and I was starting to like in my mind, uh, go through all the different stuff, but these, the comps are really, really powerful. And this is where you get to the, like, if you want to go really quite crazy with layering on a TriCaster, 
Uh, effectively, the MEs can re-enter themselves. So again, I have four inputs here, uh, four layers, but I also have four keys. Now this is different than a DSK. Keys are inside of an ME. So if you think about the hierarchical of nature of it, you have uh, D is your bottom background layer, and it goes C, B, A, and then keys one, two, three, four, key four being that top layer. And then if you bring that onto program with eight layers of video, you can then have DSK one, two, three, four, which would then go on top of those, uh, be the next layers up. And because we can do ME, you see the MEs are available. I can make, uh, again, ME one is my uh, video with me comp. So if I bring on ME one, I can now go through and zoom that in. So you can have the MEs come into MEs, which means you get eight, you know, you can stack them up to where, again, I think every once in a while you'll see people get bored in the TriCaster forums and someone will be like, how many pips can you actually get? And I think the answer is somewhere around 72 objects on screen at one point, it's which actually I don't in recommend. the millions, it, it's like way, way <laughs> up there because you, because of all this inner, inner, Plenty, yeah. because you can put something that's that's built out into another that's built out. So you have eight layers, into another eight layers, into another eight layer. It depends on the model of the machine yep. too, uh, because this one has four MEs. Uh, the TC2 has uh, eight MEs. The Vector Plus has eight MEs. The VMC1 has eight MEs. So those are there are advantages in moving up the ladder in, in the different versions too. That's awesome, though, Josh. That's exactly what I was hoping you would show. Yeah, so, and as you're doing that um, with the the MEs, the other part of that is, I'm trying to think of the best way to put this, is as you're doing those layering, like, um, I always get asked, because a lot of people be like, well, on, on Wirecast or vMix, I can just make shot after shot after shot with all these possible compositions that I ever could want. And you're absolutely right. You can go nuts, and I, I don't, um, I'm not sure about VMix. I know Wirecast will claim like unlimited layers. You know, you can go nuts as much as you want, way more than the eight that I'm talking about here. Um, but the place where I've always kind of enjoyed is the fact that I build these as needed. So, in other words, if, um, you know, the, the idea of saying, okay, I'm going to build a shot that's just Josh, my speaker, head on. But then I'm going to build a shot that's Josh plus his graphics. And then I'm going to build a shot that's Josh and this graphic. And you can then call them, but you end up with all of these shots, uh, which I prefer to kind of create them on the fly. In other words, I know that Josh is available to me under, you know, this is my keyed shot, but I know that he's here on ME1. But let's say I want to bring up that graphic. Uh, this is with the DSK. I can then say, you know what? For the next shot, if I just hit auto, you're going to see me come up and I'm going to turn off that replay thing because it's going to drive me nuts uh, back to a fade. But if I just have that set as a simple fade, that's what you get. But if I delegate the sources to where I say, hey, the, the delegation is now set to be background plus DSK1, when I transition and you know what, let's, uh, let's bring in the other graphic because that makes sense. When I hit it, I'll now fade up. And if I change the delegation to only be the graphic. When I hit it, it'll come off. It'll just be the graphic that comes off. So I didn't have to have all these other shots. I can literally build it on the fly. And if I bring you to my uh, surface, um, like delegations are up here. So right now it's background, which if I transition, it's just cutting back and forth. But if I select DSK1 only, uh, or DSK2, which is the one that has the uh, Actually, it's not the one that has graphic graphics on the other one. Hang on one second. I'll put it to there. Buffer two or buffer one, sorry. All right. So now that I've put it to DSK2, if I hit auto, DSK2 comes up. So to me, this is more in the traditional sense to say I'm going to build the show as I want it, as I'm going. And that's where, you know, as they say, you know, lose graphic one. That's the idea of saying, you know, okay. DSK2 graphic one's going to come off that type of stuff. So I'm much more used to building a show in that sense to say, I want to control all my layers as I need and build up the show uh, as needed. And then obviously inside of the Emmys, if you want to build some complicated stuff, you can do that. 
And then again, there's the comp. It allows you to animate between things, but once again, new tech does give you uh, the bins. So if I set this snapshot over here and then I change it like that and I set a snapshot again, when I click between the two, it will jump everything. Now that's an immediate. So I have literally heard where people say, ha ha, I ran out of MEs on my TriCaster TC1. I was doing too many complicated things. Well, if you set up the show uh, in a little bit more creative way, where you, when you have one particular ME on, you can adjust the others with those presets, of which there's several. So you can not only have the comps, but all those change out with the preset bins. So you can go really, really, really deep with that setup uh, to be able to basically mean that each ME has nine configurations, if you will, for a show. And so nine, four, you're up there, and then you, you can adjust them on the fly as you need. Uh, so it's, it's pretty powerful in that regard. So I've, I've never found my, it's very rare that I find myself missing the concept of, I wish there was 50 layers type thing, because I can get there if I need to. Great. Um, so yeah, I don't know if we want to hit some of the questions now. Yeah, so we have a whole bunch, and we have about 15 minutes left in the show, roughly. Um, so that it, the next question... Power through. Yeah, so the next question that came... Well, that got upvoted um, was, so would this comp option be the best way to move from a four box to a graphic one box? In other words, would this be the best way to create presets or different looks to bounce between and be able to change sources for these pips on the fly? This is a great feature that mimics the Barco S3 and E2 and other switchers that offer this way of presets uh, that we can call up on the fly. So is this comps thing uh, that you were just talking about, I guess, for to clarify for Dell Miller, something uh, that would be the best way to move from from different looks? As far it as work would though. likely be the way that I would. Yeah, I would likely do it this way. However, if there there are certain things where again the comp this is kind of magically happening if you will on the comps when you do it uh the tricaster kind of figures out so if you wanted to truly truly control exactly how things worked out in terms of like a transition between things like you saw it does a really graceful fade up fade down um you do have the priority listing so um it's called Z priority. So you can stack things to say, hey, this is one place where you can actually break the rules of uh, keys. Where normally keys are key one, two, three, four stacked. The Z priority, you can change that. So you can say, hey, um, when, and the reason you'd want to do that is when you're in a four box, uh, if you, if the graphic you want to bring full screen is inside a key one and you bring it full screen, for the first expansion, it's actually going to be underneath everyone. It won't go above them. But if you create a comp where key one is Z priority 100, in other words, it's the highest one, when you click that, it will then go on top of everything else. So that is likely the way, like when I do a, a broadcast where I have lots of speakers and I'm bouncing between them, I utilize comps. Uh, but if you wanted to control with like, say, a specific transition, I would say something like, hey, have ME1 set up for one thing, ME2 set up for another. And then once you get them ready, you have ME1 on program, you put ME2 on preview, and you can use the, an actual transition fade or whatever you want uh, to go between them and then change when the ME is off program, you can adjust that to the next thing that you want. Great, thank you for that. Um, Del Miller also wanted to know, how would you set up a score bug or a DVE overlay? Yeah, so that's the keys that we talked about where down here um if like i always have my input graphics on five and basically you'd say okay channel five or in this case i have it set to buffer one which is that so that would be my graphics overlay right there and if i'm bringing that in from my software uh whenever i bring that in that's what would be the overlay the dsks and that would give me the overlay and then if i ever needed where i'm like hey i don't want the live bug uh, that's where we get the whole program clean, which will actually lose those. So we always record our show with the program and the program clean to avoid the bugs as well. But I, I always put my uh, DS, I use my DSKs for my graphics uh, and score bugs. 
copy that. Uh, we're gonna just kind of bang through some of these. It looks like. Uh, does the TriCaster have yeah. mobile applications for Mac OS or Androids, or only or only web browser? I am only familiar with the web browser in terms of control, but like I said, it has a full API that's RESTful. So technically you can write one. Um, there is one. And uh, Sienna Touch has OST, one, which is using, um, it's on the Mac, I know, iPad, iOS. Uh, so Sienna had that, has had that out for years, but honestly the best, easiest way is without a doubt, just grabbing uh, the web page control that he showed earlier, live panel control. And it's, it just shows up on every device. It's amazing. Great. Um, oh, Del Miller, Del Miller made a comment. Yes, Josh, macros are awesome. So your your love of macros uh, <laughs> is being <laughs> appreciated. Um, it's, which try? It's the only way to run a show, man. Yeah, yeah. Uh, which TriCasters are compatible? Uh, comparable to ATEM switchers? That's not even a good question. <laughs> I know, that's which like... ATEM? That's a, yeah, which, which <laughs> ATEM, exactly. Yeah, I mean... Yeah, so the the one thing I will touch on, um, which I probably will be a little miss, when I looked at solutions, I started with uh, ATEM Television HD way back in the day uh, when I did my multi game, then I moved to a data video, hand carry, which I still love, and then the TriCaster, and... Uh, the TriCaster, like I said, it is truly a, one of the all-in-one boxes. And the reason why I went with that over, say, vMix was around the latency. With the TriCaster, if I genlock my cameras, I use the XF305s and I can genlock them, I can get 1.5 frames of latency out. And I do a lot of iMac where that matters. And when I tried that with vMix, I was a couple more frames to the point where the sync would just didn't work for in-venue iMac. So that was one of the big reasons why... I I went with that uh, with this system, and then the other part of it was when I the system that could do like the replay with four cameras. I the price went well over what a TC1 cost to get ISO recording, and then if I wanted an actual Everett's or Dreamcatcher, then it's like price just left the building for me. I'm sorry, I'm you know that's not where my price point is at. But then the operations, it was like oh. You can do T, uh, GPI and the TriCaster, or I'm sorry, the ATEM does have some uh, newer controls to control their stream decks to do plays. But the like, if you're recording, you can't play back. If you're playing, if you want to play back, you got to stop recording. So for replay, that's why I, to kind of Jeff's point, it's like I wouldn't really call the a comparable. It's just a different beast. Um, but at the same time, they're you know the right tool for the place. If I'm just being told switch a show uh, for iMac, where all I'm doing is cutting between a camera and like say a PowerPoint, I don't take my TriCaster. I take my little hand carry data video that is literally a suitcase with a 17 inch monitor. It weighs like six pounds and it does perfectly well at that. It's phenomenal for that. Um, and that's what I used to use my ATEM for as well. Great. Now, I so here's my question for you. Do you consider, and, and this would be for Jeff too, do you consider the TriCaster a hardware switcher or a software switcher? It's an appliance. So uh, before, <laughs> so here, here's the argument I'll, I'll give anybody else. Uh, now I'm going to the tech side. Uh, the, your ATEM is running an FPGA. There's software, there's an OS. If we, Look at the uh, ROS, they're using like embedded Linux. So I like when people say they don't use software switchers, I kind of giggle saying, well, do you really know what's behind that thing? Now I will not go out to per try and perpetuate to say that I haven't had issues with my TriCaster. Like I said, most of them have been TriCaster bugs, knock on wood. Like I've been very good about with the Windows side of it. I don't install other software. I haven't had Windows crashes. I have had TriCaster issues, bugs, but like I said, the part that I will stand by with new tech on is that when I file a ticket with them and explaining what I did and how I reproduce this thing, they fix it, which that's all I feel like I could ever ask for. Sure, I wish the bug never happened, but working in software development, bugs, humans cause bugs. There's no way around it. So if they're responsive and work on it, then I call that a win. Um, so I don't consider this a hardware switcher. 
Um, I do know that there's a lot of specialized hardware in it, which is why they can get to 1.5 frames of latency and not four or five, like some of the other quote unquote pure software solutions. Um, but yeah, uh, to me, they're all software, all the modern ones anyways. Uh, that's a, that's a fair enough answer. And you're on mute. Yeah. Yeah. That, that's a fair enough answer. Uh, it is, it is important to distinguish though, for people who might not be familiar that, uh, when you buy a TriCaster box, it is running on a windows machine that, uh, is comes with windows the embedded windows embedded that's the key right. thing this is not just off the shelf windows home off the shelf windows home that just just happen to get installed from best buy it is truly a very tweaked version of windows embedded so they've worked out all the problems on the windows side it just happens to be riding on top of it uh, one other thing i wanted to point out that is a huge thing that we tend to work i forget about it at times um, I had to integrate a system a couple of weeks ago with an ATM. Um, th so with the Blackmagic, everybody that uses it knows that you have to have, well, not all the models, but the most of the models, you have to have the same resolution all the way across the board, right? Well, with the TriCaster, it's whatever you plug into it, you can go with it. So whether it's a, a even an SD signal or an HD signal of any format, any type, an HD uh all the way up to 1080p but then the next step after that is 4k so then even i'm working in a in a regular hd project whether it be 720p or 1080p i could take a 4k input in and use that whole input every bit of the color information every bit of the input at, now that's coming in via ndi uh, but that is definitely one of the strongest points and there's no need for external gen lock like uh josh is using external gen lock to just get an extra frame of that extra little bit that he might need to get a, a uh, application like this doing what he was saying uh, image magnification to get it just a little bit closer but if you're just going out to stream or going to broadcast where an extra couple of frames is not going to matter you just plug your cameras in and roll and that that's a beautiful beautiful thing Thanks for that, Jeff. Yeah. Thanks for, for adding and, um, that. The, yeah, the um, one thing I will say that uh, I have not been able to test with this. I'm a big guy on latency with testing. Um, when I was doing after the last update, the NDI latency, if I re-enter the TriCaster from the TriCaster's loopback test, it's one frame, which means as I do NDI switching of sources and then output, if I have, say, a bird dog next to a projector, I haven't had a chance to do this. But I know the TriCaster is projecting out at one frame of latency on full NDI. So if the bird dog gets to start drawing after whatever it is, 16 lines, um, I may actually be able to get a faster output using a bird dog. I haven't had a chance to try that. Or technically any NDI output that would go to, say, an SDI or HDMI for a projector. But it is, it is pretty crazy how the TriCaster works. And Jeff touched on this last week about the fact of when I have a NDI input on one of these inputs, if it's not on program, it's going to use the low res uh, version. And as soon as I cut to it, it goes to the high res. So if you watch your network resources, which um, you have the ability to do under performance, you can see uh, what my CPU, the memory, the GPU, and also the NIC, you know, it's at 12%. And I'm actually running a couple NDI sources in and out, but it's not until they get utilized that they go nuts. Uh, and use that full 100 megabit or whatever it is. Uh, that's something else to touch on. We we kind of did a little bit last week was with the TriCaster, you could do 16 NDI inputs. They have a little bit of that special sauce in their implementation of NDI in their platforms. So they can do more inputs such as the VMC1 or the Vector Plus that I'm using. I could do 44 inputs, but it's not using all of those inputs live at any given time it's using a proxy over the network so it gives you a lot more ca uh, capacity and capability over the existing hardware that's there it's very smart with what they do and before it takes that input whatever you put in preview that millisecond before it goes live it goes up to the full resolution and then in whatever you took off of live goes back down to a regular res resolution now there's sometimes you may want to have all inputs certain inputs live in full res at all times those you just send to an output 
and in the, you could actually record those as a full resolution output or if it's on the network as a uh, as a pull like from NDI uh, studio monitor or something like that you can get those full resolutions out so it, it's a very efficient way that is is exclusive to the TriCaster platform of dealing with NDI in a software environment uh, this is something that none of the other software switchers, so when you start pushing in, this is just truth, guys. When you start pushing a vMix machine, a Wirecast machine, OBS, they will top out because they're only dealing with a certain amount of bandwidth available to them, not just in the NIC, but in the code itself of what they can handle as resolution. Great. And then um, um, I know we're running short on time, but there are a couple of questions that I think we could hit really quick if you want to add. Yeah, yeah. I definitely want to. We had a, most of the questions so far tonight have been coming in from the Zoom. So if, uh, you know, if you guys have uh, on Facebook want to join us and get more questions in, uh, make sure you register for our Zoom webinar because uh, that seems to be where we're getting a lot of these questions tonight. Uh, but we did get one from Facebook that, sorry, i trying to find where I put it. Uh, bu, 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 sorry. Ah, so yes, uh, Jerry on Facebook asked, uh, do you have a YouTube channel? We are brand new to TriCaster at our K through 12 school, looking to expand knowledge, enjoying this. However, it is way above our level currently. So do you have a uh, YouTube channel where you can show people what you're talking about and uh, give more knowledge? Um, I do. Um, and uh, I will, like I said, the I before I even got a TriCaster, um, there are some old school videos from a guy named Don Balance, uh, who used to work with New Tech uh, before he passed. And those recordings, the nice thing about the TriCaster in this regard, is that the interface and the working have been very consistent as they upgrade to newer things. So you can go back and look at his training videos on, say, the 8,000 and older systems and still get a really good base. And the, he will walk through the Emmys and the comps. Now, there's also uh, the New Tech, ED, uh, New Tech U, uh, which Kane and others have done some phenomenal newer content where not only those are paid classes effectively where you can get certified as a TriCaster operator um, that I would highly recommend if you have some time and can spend a little on those training, it's worth the money uh, to get those things. But, and then also um, we'll get a link over, but uh, I do have a YouTube, um, but also just my website, simplethoughtproductions.com. Uh, I do have a tutorial section where I have gone. Now I will say the tutorials I do uh, so far are based around macros and they are not intro videos. They are, we're playing with macros now and doing crazy stuff. So with that in mind, uh, I'm not going to be helping you as much with the uh, introduction, if you will. But once you get past the intro stages, which will not take long, uh, you'll, you'll be off to the races. But if you have specific questions, I'm always happy to help. Great. Uh, I'm going to post right now. I'm posting the link in the Facebook chat to, uh, to your website. Uh, and then, uh, Thank you, Jeff, for getting me that link uh, while I'm trying to get to some of these questions. Uh, we'll kind of speed round it. Uh, yeah. uh, Del Miller was asking about, oh, where did it go? Somebody, I saw that somebody else kind of answered it. Uh, can he do two, push two separate resolutions simultaneous, 1080 yeah. to say broadcast and IMAG and then 720 for a stream? Yeah, so real quick, um, that is pretty straightforward in terms of where on the mix side, I can set up. So my mix, whether that's program, generally speaking, everything's going to be uh, the same program master. And on these resolutions, I have, this is the hardware SDI outputs, uh, but I still kind of use them. And this is where I can say, hey, if I have somebody who tells me, hey, I have to have 720p, um, I do have the ability to change the resolution output of the uh, mix output of the mixes one through four. However, I usually attach like a decimator and just keep everything at whatever the session is and I let the decimators do whatever they need. However, when it comes to the streaming part, so I can control, this would be the iMag, 
on the mix outputs. But when it comes to the streaming, uh, I would select mix one, mix two, uh, two, and I would always select the highest uh, resolution that I have for these streams. The streaming is what the stream engine will use. So stream one and stream two, right now I have them set to mix one, which will basically be getting a 1080p source. But when I come over to the stream and encode section, which we didn't spend uh, any time here, uh, each I have two streaming engines on the TC1. And when I go into streaming engine one, I can choose the resolution specifically for stream engine one to say that I want at 720p for Facebook. And I want it at this bit rate with this frame rate with the audio at this or, you know, stereo versus mono. And at that point, anything I turn on, whether it's an MP4 recording saved to disc or an RTMP where we go out to different locations uh, with the various stuff and Fortunately, my passwords are hidden, which is awesome. Um, and you can turn this on for, say, stream one. And you can go to multiple destinations uh, with the TriCaster. In other words, it's only going to encode those videos one uh, for channels one and two once, but it will duplicate the stream that's going out without having to jack up the resources on the system. So I will often push out to several locations. Now, uh, that's when I'm working at a school where I'm not too worried about stuff. Obviously, you could push out to say restream.io or to a WASA instance and then go nuts. But these two uh, encodes are independent. So I could have one at 720p and the other one I could put to high and do a higher resolution or session, et cetera. I can put the bit rate to whatever the heck I want. Uh, I can use baseline or main profile or high profile, et cetera. And that would be how I would control the different resolutions of bit rates to go out to. This is what my RTMP or in the case of a recent update, I can actually output SRT now. So I could send an SRT stream out from the TriCaster using one of these encoders. Uh, that's great. So um, I think that answered the question. It looks like we have more questions than uh, we have time for, sadly. Um, so that means maybe we're gonna have to have you back, Josh, to do another talk. Um, if people have more questions, uh, you know we're kind of we're kind of running out of time. I would love to uh, pop back to the panel if we have a moment, and uh, see if anybody uh, on the panel has any questions for for Josh or comments about TriCasters. I just typed one in the in the Q and A. Um, how are you getting your signal into Zoom tonight? Are you going through an external device, or is there some output in TriCaster? Uh, I am doing it completely the wrong way, um, but I am outputting NDI and then going into a virtual input and I'm doing a couple other things that I'm not going to go into. But so basically NDI out of the TriCaster to virtual input and virtual input presents as a webcam to Zoom. Uh, I have also used the uh, Blackmagic mini recorders as a method to bring that stream in. Anybody else have anything? Uh, Omar, you've been kind of quiet all night. <laughs> That's what I just said, too. <laughs> yeah, sorry about that, guys. So I was I was actually responding to Jeff similarly. I was surprised, and, I, and I'm assuming there's a price difference here, but I've seen TriCaster I've demoed out a couple of times. I'm surprised how, how much it actually runs like a normal ME switcher. Um, I'm assuming that, you know, most times when I see the TriCaster, though, I don't see people have the switcher. And just from seeing between the transition between the switcher and the, the GUI on, on TriCaster, I mean, when I'm looking at the switcher, it looks just like a regular ME to me. So, like, everything you're saying is making sense to me. It runs very similar. I don't, I kind of don't see like people don't use it more because you're right. If you look at anything, you know, lighting console, audio consoles, they're, they're all computer softwares inside. You just have this interactual tux, you know, textile feel on the outside. Um, so, like, some of the points you're making about that, I thought were, were, were spot on. A lot of things we do, especially in the ATEM world, they're all running on computer systems internally. It's just we have this nice interface on the outside that we're able to use. And that switcher makes a huge difference because as soon as I saw it and you were switching between it, I was like, oh, okay, hold on, wait a minute. I, you know, for me, TriCaster was this whole other thing with the DDR1, DDR2, 3, and 4, and how it was laid out. It looked a little confusing. And it had some similarities to ME, but just from watching, watching you tonight and hearing you, um, it is an ME. It's just it's a hybrid between... What we're used to seeing now in the new, you know, the new live event side with with the streaming and the and the light and the switching production side, it's all kind of in one now. So TriCaster's already been 
what people want now, TriCars has been doing is what it, it seems like to me. So I was super excited about this talk. Um, sorry to get the comment more. I was I was sucked into it more more a surprise because I haven't used TriCaster for anything, uh, and I, I don't get calls for it. So I've never thought to learn it. Uh, I've only demoed it out, and I just demoed it recently with my, my buddy Trevor from Digital Productions to get some hands on. And even then, I was like, okay, I, I get this part here, I get the Emmy here, I get how this works over here. Um, but hearing you talk about it and kind of running through things, I mean, honestly, had, had I done that demo with that switcher, I'd be like, oh, I got this. Boom, 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 real quick and easy. So I was very impressed by it. Uh, I'm uh, slightly converting now to TriCaster. <laughs> well, I think you do have to mention, though, that 1.5 frames um, is is still a little long for iMag. It's it's pushing the pushing the edges. So um, so it does yeah. have its use cases in broadcast yeah. and streaming uh -huh. and certain. Yeah, you know, there's lots of amazing things it can do, but. But yeah, it, it's um, that's a conversation you have to have with your client is if you want to use it for iMag, it's it's going to have just that slight delay. Yeah, hopefully they don't do like presenters here yeah. on the podium and then iMag's right here because then then that's right. when it's, it's, it's all about so. educating the client of what what to expect. Exactly. No, I agree yeah. completely. That's that was always a long time. I've been using them in iMag uh, installations a lot. But when they stack screens right on top of you, yeah, you're you're just going to be hurt. Mm -hmm. Right. That's when you need these. a grass valley or something else. Uh, yeah. Grass valley, or you could go with an ATEM in that situation. Yeah. Uh, and again, with companion uh, or uh, or central control now, control both of them at the same time. So you've got one control surface that you can sit there and hit multiple machines commands, and it's it's just a great workflow. Uh, and you get the control of the clip playback is probably the the best thing I like about the TriCaster and how flexible it is. Uh, but whenever you started cutting into multiple cameras just to simple iMag and stuff, there's there's no shame using a, a piece of hardware that does it a little bit faster. I mean, it's a little shame, a little, <laughs> but it, it's definitely it's you know right tool for the right job. Plan on it. Yeah. So well, I, I think something also just place... to to maybe touch on real quick is. 1.5 frames of latency uh, is going to be different depending on what frame rate you're working at. So is TriCaster natively, yep. uh, and is it variable? Can you switch it from 59 to 60 yes, or 30? Yes. Yeah, so that's that's the thing. I run it, when I'm doing iMag, I run it 60p, so the 1.5 frame is up for less of a duration. So in my experience, uh, when I was uh, three frames is the place where I know my clients see it and they're like, what's up? The guy waved and then his arm kind of came up after him and they complain about that. Um, but at 1.5 frames when I'm running at a 60 frame session and my cameras are set to, set to 60p, et cetera, uh, I haven't had anyone call me out yet to say like, that's, that's too far off. Um, everyone's been able to go through and depending on the venues that we're in, we've done some in the Amway here in Orlando where most people have distance and then at that point, you have all sorts of fun stuff trying to get the audio to be in sync, depending on how far people are back anyways. Um, so it gets really complicated, but yeah, that's that. this was the happy medium of all in one box and at 1.5 frames, which I can get away with with iMag versus four to five to six frames and everybody is going, what's wrong with this? Uh, so yeah. Well, the main thing is- But if uh, somebody if is crazy about it, hardware switcher. Yeah, if you're going to a projection system, you're probably fine. Uh, but when you get into an LED wall, it's adding its own frame and a half. And every frames. projector could have a different set of delay itself. There there were some yeah. barcos so, that were just horrendous. And you had to go in and turn the, uh, it was the HD18, I think it was, uh, had to go in and turn the processing off. Right. And, and it was different latency yes. if you went in DVI versus SDI. Correct. So those are there's so many yep. more things in the chain that become an issue when you start talking yep. about latency. Yeah, we we work with a particular staging company where they have projectors that take SDI input and we know the latency. And I've also worked with their projectionists that they do not like they do a lot of rear projection for us. And when we set those up, we do not use any of the processing. They love to do perfect edge. So they'll they won't have a perfect area behind to set up the projector and they'll normally use the digital solutions to be able to make it edge to edge perfect and beautiful. 
but that adds latency. So whenever we do those, it's like, sorry, buddy, whatever you can get by physically moving the projector, that's what you're going to be able to use. But if you add that other stuff, the latency kicks in and it's not even from my side, it's from the projector at that point. So whenever we do those types of shows, it's, yep, it's no digital effects, no crop, uh, the trapezoid, you know, all the extra stuff uh, that I don't usually mess with, but it is, uh, there's uh, three projectors that we'll use and one of them 720, the others are 1080 native. And we like, that's part of it is we make sure like if I have to do an unknown projector, we'll find out what's its native resolution. If it's 720, that's what I'm going to send to it. If it's 1080, I'll send that because all of them will scale, but their scalers usually add quite a few frames compared to say like a decimator or some other solution. And, and that, I think that's the latency thing. It separates the hardware from the software switchers. Um, is you're going through a CPU to do some of the fancy whiz bank stuff that a TriCaster can do and all the recording and playback simultaneous. Um, that's what separates it. There is a solution for it. Yep. Is whenever you're in, a, if you're in a room big enough, you always walk the client and meet them at the back of the room. That's the solution. <laughs> stage them it's like look it's perfect right here yeah and that's where you show them not sitting in front of the stand or, or, or right in front of the screen or right in front of the of the uh stage yeah back of the room I, so yeah, I, I am i am curious about one thing and, I, and i'll kind of wrap it up with this so we don't stay out too long because because honestly this could be a whole topic in its own uh, you know these are everybody here is high end we all know every variable that could possibly be to cause a delay in the system but with the truck with the tricaster can swapping out the cards the io card help improve that or get rid of it it sounds like no it's proprietary so okay. you you don't pull apart the you're not supposed <laughs> to pull apart your tricaster <laughs> let me put it that away you're supposed to 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 mother it and and worship it and keep it in pristine condition not pull out their hard drives and put faster hard drives in like some people wherever he is <laughs> uh, but you know, sometimes you got to do things and, and, uh, it is a whole, the whole input and output system is completely proprietary. And that's one of the reasons why it can get both reliability and more performance is because of all the extra good stuff that's in there. All right. So there's some very smart, yeah, I mean, optimizing the GPU CPU for that, for that. There's software. no, you should never touch that part. No, yeah. It's they're... very tweaked for that and the amount of RAM. Even and the, the type of RAM, the amount of RAM, you don't just pop the processor out and put a new one in. Um, but there are people that I know of that have taken the hard drives out maybe and, and improved that subsystem, which that's not as big of an issue. Support it or I not. I would take a, a hard drive. Do an engine swap on a car, but you don't want to do an engine swap on an airplane. You know, and yeah. anything I use for work, I, I would use the airplane analogy <laughs> yeah and to be perfectly honest when i have yet to see any other capture card that's going into like a software switcher that doesn't have more latency in other words uh when i've i've done the with the black magic those are usually like three or four frames when i get to any of the software to see what it's doing so um new tech uh to jeff's earlier point there is some proprietary stuff where they're doing things from the capture card to the video card and then back out to the output of the capture card without necessarily touching the cpu and the irq like all the other stuff that usually causes late that's how they got to 1.5 frames i am not aware of any other switcher that's quote unquote software that's going to get close to 1.5 frames and like i said mm -hmm. if you use their ndi system it's sitting at one frame from the testing I was doing, which I, again, That's I haven't really tested really to say like a bird dog or yeah, like uh, I'll do the loop out and back in. Like when I test the TriCaster, I usually output SDI and then bring the SDI back to an input and then check the sync with the time code. And that's where I get the 1.5 frames of latency from the TriCaster. Um, but with NDI, it's one. And I've seen that on to say a laptop that's watching the stream. Now, um, most other folks aren't going to be able to accept, but like I said, if you get a bird dog decoding it to a projector, that could be a one frame. Uh, that might get you in range wow. to where you could use the LED walls. But you're all right. That's why I don't use LED walls, because my latency wouldn't work with them. I use projectors, <laughs> and I don't go outside in Florida. Nobody <laughs> wants to go outside in Florida. Not in the summer. 
Right, and that just comes back to you know Which knowing is, yeah. what, what gear you have and what the scenarios for what you're using it for, and and using our our skill sets to know, hey, this is not what you want for this particular setup. So before before we close up, I want to yeah. do a little announcement. Uh, our next episode on Sunday, October 25th, we'll be discussing computer anatomy, led by our co-host Christopher Brown, aka Bodie, who couldn't be here with us tonight. Uh, for for more info, we're going to drop that event page. It's in the uh, Zoom side here. We'll drop it on the Facebook side as well. And then before we wrap up tonight, I know we went 18 minutes over. We got some very cool information here. Josh, thank you for being here so much. Thomas, thank you for being here. Deja, thank you so much as well for coming. You know, I did I say that right by the way? Deja, Deja, Deja. Lisa, thank Lisa. you for having me. <laughs> oh, no, thank you for being here so much. I appreciate everybody's here always, especially to the, uh, to the panelists, to the to the community on Facebook. And again, like always, I will let Ed or somebody else or wherever we wrap up. I don't like having the last words. So, Ed, do you have anything you want to wrap up to the community before we uh, we kill the stream for tonight? Uh, no, just again, thank you guys for joining us. Um, thank you to our panel for being here. Thank you, Josh and Jeff, for all the great information. And for all the questions on Facebook and through the um, the webinar, uh, we've posted the webinar link uh, to register a handful of times in the chat. So if uh, if you're not here in the room with us, please feel free to register so you can join us on Zoom, get a little bit closer to the action. Uh, we would also just take another moment to thank uh, DVE Store again for their support of AV Tech Talks. Uh, you can check them out at dvestore.com. Uh, give them a, a, you know, check them out. Uh, talk to Guy and his team. They can help you with all your video solution needs. Very knowledgeable over there and will help you get the right thing to tackle the job you're looking to tackle. Um, so with that, uh, I posted the link to the event page for next week. As Omar said, we'll be talking about computer anatomy, which uh, I'm looking forward to because I'm actually in the middle of putting together a list of parts for a vMix machine. So I am super excited that Chris is going to walk us through that before I've really spent too much money yet. So, <laughs> <laughs> so that's, that's, that's great. Um, if anybody else from the panel has anything to say, otherwise we're going to, we're just going to kick it off to Facebook and, uh, and thank everybody for, for joining us. No? It was great guys. Thanks for having us. Thanks. Great job, Josh. Thank Fantastic you. job. Appreciate Don it. would be proud. Thank you, Jeff, and thank you, Josh. Right. Have a great, great night. So everybody wave goodbye to Facebook. And thank you guys for joining us. We'll see you next week.